Daryl informs Maggie that she was taken away in a black car with a white cross on the back seat, and that she is alive. Meanwhile, Rick and the rest of their group are trapped in a train carriage. They quietly make weapons using scraps of clothing and the inside of the car. Their kidnappers release tear gas into the carriage, catching them by surprise. Rick, Daryl, and Glenn Beans are brought to the slaughterhouse, where Terminus residents begin to strike and slit the throats of other captives in an alarmingly neat and precise manner, allowing blood from the cut throat to ooze into the gutter, presumably to drain the blood from them before preparing them for food. The first to be killed is Sam, a young man whom Rick and Carol met during a hike before Carol's exile. Before Glenn is killed, Harry interrupts to question Rick about the bag he hid in the woods. At first Rick refuses, but after Gareth threatens to stab Bob in the eye, Rick admits that there are weapons in it, including rifles, pistols, a bow and a machete. And the last thing he says to Gareth, that's what I'm going to kill you with. The butchers behind Glenna prepare to kill him again, but before Glenn gets hit with a baseball bat, shots are heard outside, followed by a powerful explosion. Earlier in the day, Carol and Tyrese head to Terminus carrying Judith. They hear gunshots and watch as a herd of walkers flock to the noise. They arrive at a hut where Martin, a resident of Terminus, sets off fireworks to scare the walkers away from Terminus. Carol and Tyrese hear him mention the members of the group on the radio, and take him at gunpoint. Carol takes the explosives from Martin and sets off towards Terminus, smeared with the guts of walkers to disguise herself. Meanwhile, Tyrese is watching Martin in the hut. Martin tries to convince Tyrese to take his car and leave with Judith. At the perimeter fence, Carol sees Garrett's men dragging Rick, Daryl, Glenn and Bob to the slaughterhouse. She shoots a propane tank inside Terminus, then launches one of Martin's fireworks into the breach, resulting in a massive explosion. Walkers break into the building and start killing its inhabitants. At the slaughterhouse, Rick calmly cuts his handcuffs, made of rope, with a wooden stick that he hid in his sock. He frees himself and, along with Daryl, Glenn and Bob, makes his way out. Mary sees walkers coming through a hole in the fence and runs inside to the memorial room. Carol, disguised as a walker, enters Terminus with the herd. Maggie, Carl, Michonne, Sasha and Abraham's team are anxiously waiting in the train carriage after hearing the commotion outside. Terror reigns, walkers feast on the inhabitants of Terminus. Carol, taking advantage of the confusion, shoots Terminus snipers. When Rick, Daryl, Glenn and Bob leave the slaughterhouse, they see human body parts hanging from meat hooks. Rick tells his group that if they come across other Terminus residents, they should kill them without hesitation. They hear someone shouting and knocking from the warehouse. On the way to rescue the other survivors, Glenn insists on opening another train car to free the prisoners inside. But when they do, an abnormal man runs out of there with wild screams, and then a walker attacks him. Carol discovers a room filled with things stolen from Terminus victims. She finds Rick's watch, which he gave to Sam, and Daryl's crossbow. Rick's group ambushes a group of Terminus residents and takes their weapons. Carol discovers the sanctuary of Terminus. Mary confronts her and they fight. When Carol gets the upper hand, Mary explains that Terminus used to be a real sanctuary until a group of looters raped and killed her people. The lesson, Mary explains, is, either you're a butcher or you're a brute. Carol, unconvinced, shoots her in the leg and leaves her to be torn to pieces by walkers. Returning to the hut, Tyrese is distracted by the approaching walkers. Martin grabs Judith and threatens to kill her if Tyrese doesn't come out. Tyrese obeys, and Martin listens to his screams while the walkers attack. Martin goes to check if Tyrese is alive, Tyrese bursts through the door and knocks Martin down. Outside, the ground is littered with walkers that Tyrese killed with his bare hands. Returning to the train car, Eugene says that before the fall, he helped develop harmful viruses to fight other harmful diseases. He says that his team has developed a system that can kill all people on the planet, and the same system may be able to destroy walkers. Rick's team rescues the rest of the group from the train car. Reunited, they make their way out of Terminus. Rick leads the group to a cache of weapons in the woods. He insists that they return and kill the remaining residents of Terminus, but the others do not agree. The fences are down, Maggie thinks. They will run or die. Carol appears. Daryl runs up to Carol and hugs her tightly, both of them are irritated by tears of joy, seeing that they are alive and well. Did you do that? Rick asks, hugging her too and thanking her for saving him. Carol leads everyone to the cabin, 
where Tyrese Judith is waiting for them. Rick and Carl run there and happily reunite with the baby, and Sasha hugs his brother. While the group is resting, Tyrese tells Carol that he killed Martin. Rick decides that they will get as far away from Terminus as possible. Abraham intends to tell Rick about their mission, but is not going to yet. The group walks along the railway tracks until they come across a Terminus sign. Rick crosses out most of the text and changes it like this. There is no shelter. A few months after Rick's escape from Terminus, a masked stranger walks along the railroad tracks. He stops to look at the Terminus sign that Rick has changed and hangs his head. The sign is a little more overgrown than when we saw Rick changing it, which suggests that several months have passed. The stranger takes off his mask. It's Morgan. He begins to follow a series of markings on the trees, a circle with the letter A inside, in an unknown direction. It is unknown who exactly left these signs. The group is on the road again and decides to take a break. While Glenn and Maggie exchange tender words, Tara approaches the scream. You didn't want to be there. That's why I tried to talk to you, Rick tells Tara, remembering how he called Tara before the bloody fight with the governor. He thanks her for saving Glenn and welcomes her to the group and even accepts her offer to clap his fist. Carol and Tyrese fill bottles with water from the stream and discuss whether the group will accept Carol for the murder of Karen and David in prison. Carol says they don't have to accept it, but Tyrese insists she does. Tyrese says they don't need to talk about Lisa and Mickey, he says he just wants to forget about what happened. The group continues on their way and stumbles upon a lone walker. Michonne says she can handle it, and reflexively pulls out the katana she lost in Terminus. Sighing, she deals with him, hitting him with her weapon and punching his head with the butt. Abraham sees this and says to Razite, that's why we are waiting in the wings. That night, when the group is camping in the woods, Rick talks to Carol. I owe you everything, he tells her. Carol answers, you owe Tyrese, he was in jail. Carol takes Rick's watch out of her bag and gives it to him. He tells Carol that he saw the residents of Terminus kill Sam. He offers her to return the watch but she refuses. Rick regrets sending her away, to which she responds, you said I could survive. You were right. He notices the irony of kicking her out and then having to live with her on the road, and turns things around by asking for permission to join her instead of giving her permission to return to the group. Will you accept us? He asks. She nods. Later that night in the woods, Carol and Daryl sit together and have the opportunity to talk about the terrible things that have happened lately. But after a long silence, she says she doesn't want it. I just need to forget it, she says, repeating Tyrese's words. They both hear the noise and get up to look. Daryl says it's okay. In another camera angle, a silhouette moves through the trees in front of Daryl and Carol. The next day, walking through the forest, everyone hears a noise and prepares weapons. Daryl comes out of the woods with several squirrels that he caught. We give up, he says jokingly. Daryl tells Rick that he didn't see any trace of whoever was following them last night. Abraham begins to persuade Rick to accept his plan, innocently offering to find a way and go north until they find a car. Bob and Sasha are playing a game called the good out of the bad, where Sasha talks about the bad, and Bob has to find a positive moment. For example, the danger around every corner is never boring. They kiss, and Sasha explains the game to Tyrese, who happily watches what is happening. The group hears cries for help, and Carl convinces Rick to help. There they find a man, judging by his clothes, a preacher, sitting on a rock surrounded by walkers. The group deals with the walkers, and then forms a perimeter, looking incredulously at the still frightened man. Rick tells the man that he can come down, and he comes down, he is clean and neatly dressed. Rick asks if he's okay and the man spits, apologizes, thanks the group, and introduces himself as Father Gabriel. Gabriel says he doesn't have a gun and that the word of God is the only protection he needs, to which Daryl responds cynically, of course, it doesn't sound like. Gabriel says he called for help and God responded with their arrival. He asks for food, and Carl offers a meager handful of nuts. Gabriel sees the baby and says that Judith is a wonderful child. When Rick pressed him, he said he had a church. Rick forces him to raise his hands above his head, searches him for weapons, and asks him three questions from prison. How many walkers have you killed? Actually, none. Rick continues, how many people have you killed? Not one. Gabriel answers. Why? Because the Lord turns away from violence. Rick presses it. 
What did you do? We've all done something. I am a sinner, I sin almost every day. But I confess these sins to God, not to outsiders. As they head to Gabriel's church, Rick asks if Gabriel has been following them. Gabriel says he stays in the country because people are just as dangerous as the dead. No, people are worse, Rip says. Gabriel says that the rock has been the farthest from his church since its foundation, but then starts cheekily joking that maybe he is lying and leading them into a trap to steal all their squirrels. Members of my congregation have often told me that my sense of humor leaves much to be desired, says Gabriel, when he sees a not too friendly reaction to his joke. Soon the group stays in the church. Rick cautiously asks permission to enter the church first. Gabriel unlocks the door and the group enters, weapons at the ready. Inside, Carol finds a book on the table that shows that Gabriel or someone else copied the Bible by hand. On one page he wrote in huge letters you must not kill. Vic finds empty food cans around the altar. Michonne draws attention to children's drawings. Rick calls the rest of the people. Abraham offers to fix the church bus and take it to Washington. Michonne wants to rest and gather supplies first, and Rick agrees. Abraham looks like he wants to object, but Glenn tells them that one way or another they will follow Rick and not split up. Tara adds as he said, and even Bob joins in. Inside, Gabriel says that he lives off the food collected in the church during the annual canned food collection campaign, as well as in the garbage. He says he cleaned out all the nearby houses, except one, which was filled with about a dozen walkers. Bob and Sasha agree to go with Rick to check on him, and Taris agrees to sit with Judith. Rick thanks Tyrese for his help. Rick forces Gabriel to go with them because he doesn't trust him. Before leaving, Rick talks to Carl. Carl says he trusts Gabriel because he thinks everyone can't be bad. Rick tells Carl that Gabriel may have friends and needs him to stay to help Tyrese protect Judith. Rick tells Carl that, no matter what, he is not safe and promises him never to let his guard down. However, before leaving, Carl tells him that they are strong enough, that they can still help people and that they don't need to be afraid or hide. However, Rick still believes that Gabriel is hiding something. On the way to the food bank, Rick, Gabriel, Bob, Sasha and Michonne are going to shovel garbage. Bob tries to persuade Rick to go to Washington. Although Rick is not even sure that he is going to go, Bob is convinced that Eugene will be able to cure the virus and everything will return to normal. And if you let too much go by itself, nothing will work, says Bob. Rick says it's the real world, and Bob says no, it's a nightmare, and the nightmares end. Carol and Daryl are walking down the road with four jugs of water that they have collected. Carol doesn't want to talk about what happened when she was separated from the group. Daryl says they can start over and that Carol saved them, but she just says they're lucky. They come across an abandoned car, and Carol decides to check it out. The car's battery seems low, but Daryl interrupts her when she checks the trunk. We are not dead. And whatever happened, it happened. Let's start over, Daryl says. Carol says she wants to, and Daryl says she can, although he doesn't look convinced. Carol finds an emergency starter in the trunk. She pushes the button and shows that he has a little charge left, so she says that they should leave the car as a safety net in case things go badly at the church. Maggie and Tara perform a separate task, robbing a gun store. The door is knocked out, and they both agree that the chances that there are remnants left are extremely small. There is a noise from inside, and they take out their weapons. Rick's group is staying at what Gabriel says was a food bank that served the entire neighborhood. They take out their weapons and carefully go inside. There's a huge hole in the floor. It leads to a basement filled with water and smelly, decomposed walkers. If the sewer could vomit, that's what it would smell like, Bob says. Sasha suggests using several metal shelves in the mud to block the walkers, Rick agrees that this is a good plan. They climb onto the shelves, and Rick forces a frightened Gabriel to go with them. Inside, the water reaches to their waist. Gabriel sees a walker who looks like a church lady with big glasses and panics. He tries to climb the ladder, but it breaks. The others push the shelves and fight their way through the walkers to save Gabriel. Rick catches up with a walking church lady and breaks her rotten head before she can grab Gabriel. Bob comes up for supplies and confidently says, I know which way it will break. While he is dragging a crate of supplies, the walker pulls him down into the water. 
Bob climbs back up, fighting with a walker who looks like he's rotted to the ground. Bob impales him on a pipe, and Sasha smashes his head with a storage container. She walks up to Bob and asks if he's okay, and he replies that he's fine, although he's obviously shaken. The group loads huge carts with lots of food and leaves. Gabriel apologizes for the panic. Rick asks if he knew the walking church lady when she was still alive, and Gabriel doesn't answer. Yes, I get it. You tell your sins only to God, Rick says sarcastically. On the way, Rick asks Michonne if she misses her skating. She says it's not hers anyway, she found it at the beginning of the outbreak. She says she felt so good when she killed with it all day, but it wasn't life for her. Michonne says she misses Andre and Herschel, but she doesn't miss what happened before, and that she doesn't miss her skating. Back at the church, Carl shows Rick the deep scratches on the window, indicating that people tried to get into the church. He also discovered that someone had scrawled the words you will burn for this on the outer wall of the church. It doesn't mean that Gabriel is definitely a bad guy, but it means something, says Carl. In the evening, the group arranges a fun holiday. Abraham makes a toast. He says that each of the group has earned the title of survivor and makes a toast. To the survivors, and everyone raises a toast in return, but he continues, is that all you want to be? He asks and stands for Washington again. He says that just to survive is just to give up. Carol is thinking about running out the door into the car she found at that moment. Abraham says that Eugene will make the dead die, and the living will find this world again, and this is not a bad idea for a little road trip. Eugene says there is an infrastructure in place to withstand pandemics even on such a FUBAR scale, which means food, fuel, shelter, and an end to the walking plague. Looking at Judith, Abraham asks them to save the world for this baby, or for himself, or for those out there. Rick hears Judith cooing and jokes, she's in business, and if she's in business, then I'm in business, let's do it, and everyone applauds. Bob asks Sasha to kiss him again, and then gets up and leaves, clearly lost in thought. Tara uses this time to tell Maggie that she was in jail with the governor. She says she didn't know who he was or what he could do. Maggie forgives her and says, now you're here with us, and hugs her. The face thanks Gabriel for his hospitality and allows them to drink wine for communion. Gabriel drinks it too, he says it's just wine until it's lit up, and there's no one to take communion anyway. Lick tells Gabriel that he knows that he is hiding something. These people are my family. And if what you're hiding so far does them any harm, I'll kill you, Rick says. Carol runs to the abandoned car. She starts it up, but the noise of the engine attracts a walker, whom she stabs. Daryl comes out of the woods and asks what she's doing. Carol, slightly confused, replies that she doesn't know. He tries to bring her back to the church, and it seems that she is going to go, but at that moment they hear and then see a car speeding past. Daryl runs to the road she drove down to check, and notices that this black car with a distinctive white cross on the back, similar to the one that Beth took. They took Beth, Daryl says, hastily switching the car's headlights. They both climb into the car and give chase. Bob is outside smiling a happy smile that disappears when he looks at the church. Then he goes into the forest, leans against a tree and cries. Then a robed figure with a hood hits him from behind. There is a symbol on the tree that looks like a horizontal line with a small vertical line descending from the right edge, possibly related to the footprints that Morgan saw. Bob wakes up and sees blurry faces and fire. These are the remaining residents of Terminus. One of them, Martin, is beaten, but not dead, as Tyrese claimed. The good news is that you're not dead yet, says Gareth. Bob is tied to a post. Gareth says they didn't want to hurt them before, but that's what they have to do. You and your people have taken our house away from us, in order to survive, we must hunt. In one of the frames, Gabriel looks at a photo of a church lady who was a church organist with him when she was alive. The Terminus people say they hope Bob understands that it's not personal, that even though they put them in this situation, they would do it to anyone. Gareth says that in the end, no matter how much they hate all these vile things, a person should eat. Bob is shown that his left leg is missing, amputated at about the knee. He starts to panic from the shock. Garrett bites off the cooked leg of Bob right in front of his eyes. If it makes you feel better, you're much tastier than we thought, says Garrett. 
the terminants feast on the leg of the bean, which is now being roasted on a spit. While Garrett continues to talk calmly to Bob, while the walkers growl at them from the original school near which they camped, Bob becomes more and more upset. Gareth admits that his group left marks on trees to find their way to Terminus and back. Finally, Bob starts giggling, and then gets annoyed with laughter when Harry tries to reproach him for not listening to him. The other members of the group come up and say that Bob has gone crazy. Bob, however, happily pulls off his shirt, exposing the bite wound on his shoulder, and laughingly explains that he was bitten and therefore he is spoiled meat. When the members of his group react in horror, Burns angrily kicks Bob, knocking him unconscious, explaining at the same time that they will be fine, because they cooked it. Sasha leaves the church in search of Bob, and after killing two walkers, Rick and Tyrese join her, who lead her back to the house. Sasha claims that they are being watched by unknown people, and angrily attacks Gabriel, accusing him of involvement in Bob's disappearance. Rick pulls her away from Gabriel and calmly turns to Gabriel himself, demanding to know what Gabriel did in the past so that someone would write you will burn for this on the wall of his church. Gabriel, with tears in his eyes, says that at the beginning of the apocalypse, he forbade everyone else to enter the church, allowing them to be killed by walkers. He tearfully declares that Rick's group was sent by God to finally punish him. As Rick listens, a faint whistle sounds outside, and Glenn reports that someone has been left lying in the grass. Rick's group rushes to Bob lying in the grass and begins to carry him into the house while the walkers approach. However, the Terminators open fire on them from the trees, and Rick blindly fires all his bullets into the trees. When he turns to go back inside, he discovers the letter or written in blood on the side of the church, a sign that they were prisoners there until Gareth decided to kill them. Inside the church, Bob regains consciousness and reveals that Gareth and five other survivors of the Terminus are guilty of having no leg. However, he can only give vague details about their whereabouts. Sasha asks Rosita if they have anything that could ease his pain, but Bob refuses and shows the group his bite. Glenn reminds them that Jim lived two days before they left him to die. Gabriel tells them they can put Bob on the couch in his office, and Sasha thanks him. While Sasha is taking care of Bob, Rick asks Gabriel if he recognized the place that Bob described. He doesn't seem to want to answer, but admits that it looks like Bob was held at an elementary school, which is to the south and a short walk from the church. Rick meets with the group to discuss their next steps. Daryl and Carol are still missing, so he suggests they track down Garrett's group. Abraham disagrees, fearing that it would be too difficult to ensure Eugene's safety in such a hostile area. Therefore, he believes that they should leave immediately. Rick and Abraham begin to argue and almost come together in a duel, until Glenn finally persuades Abraham to agree to stay for another half day. In exchange, Glenn guarantees that he, Maggie and Tara will accompany them to Washington. As the group prepares to leave to confront Garrett, Sasha comforts Bob. While he is sleeping, Tyrese approaches Sasha and asks her not to go with them to meet Garrett. Sasha reminds him of how he felt when Karen was killed, but Tyrese claims that back then he was just blinded by anger and that forgiveness comes only when a person truly faces his demons. Sasha angrily asks if he is asking her to forgive Garrett for everything he has done and points out that they had no choice but to kill him. Tyrese disagrees, saying that while the rest of the group doesn't have a choice, she does. Sasha finally agrees and gives Tyrese his dagger, telling him to stick it in Bob's temple after his death. Under the cover of night, Rick, Michonne, Sasha, Glenn, Maggie, Tara and Abraham leave the church to go to elementary school. When they hide in the forest, Terminants appear, who arrived at the church by another way, and break in. While they search the church, Gareth asks the group to come out, saying that he knows that Rick took some of the group members and most of their weapons to the elementary school. When they don't obey, he calls Father Gabriel, saying that if he reveals himself and the group, they will spare him and even let him leave with Judith. During the search, Judith begins to cry and gives away the location of the group. Gareth and the Terminants give the survivors one last chance to get out before breaking down the door, and when no one answers, order the Terminants to enter by force. Albert and Might approach the door, but both get shot in the head from behind. The Terminants turn around when Rick appears from the shadows and orders them to drop their weapons. Gareth begins to panic and tries to force Rick to retreat by threatening the rest of his group, but Rick unceremoniously shoots off his middle and index fingers, pointing at the door. 
Gareth falls to his knees and orders the rest of the Terminants to do what Rick says. All of them, except Martin, kneels down, who insists that they were not defeated. Abraham comes out of the shadows, presents the rifle to Martin's head and orders him to get down, which Martin does. Rick then goes to Garrett, who tries to tell Rick that they used to be good people who really accepted newcomers to Terminus until they showed up, changed everything, and tries to convince Rick to let them go. Rick explains why it's too dangerous for him, then reminds Gareth of the promise he made to him back in Terminus. Then he pulls a red-handled machete from his belt and cuts Garrett with it, who screams in agony while Rick, Michonne, Sasha and Abraham chop and beat to death the remaining Terminants. When it's over, Gabriel opens the door and inspects the carnage, and Rick, Michonne and Abraham walk past him to check on the rest of the group. Gabriel is shocked, he looks at Maggie and Glenn in amazement and briefly exclaims this is the house of the Lord. Maggie looks at him and coldly replies no, it's just four walls and a roof. The next morning, all the members of the group say goodbye to Bob when he begins to succumb to the bite. Bob asks to be left alone with Rick. Bob thanks Rick for showing him that there are still good people in the world, and for sheltering him. He advises Rick to take a closer look at Judith and tell him that the world will not change. Rick takes Bob's hand for a minute before leaving, and Sasha returns to stay by Bob's side in his final moments. Bob slowly dies, Sasha bursts into tears and leaves, and Tyrese uses the knife she gave him to pierce Bob's head. Later, after burying Bob, Abraham gives Rick a map showing the route they will take to Washington. The group decided to split up. Abraham's band, along with Glenn, Maggie Guitar, goes to Washington, and the others promise to follow them after Daryl and Carol return. Then Rick opens the card and finds the message sorry, I was an asshole. Come to Washington. The new world will need Rick Drames. When the church bus with Abraham's group leaves, Rick sees Tyree digging graves for the Terminants, goes to help him and asks what it was like for him to get to Terminus. Tyrese answers, it killed me, after a while and says, no, it didn't. That night, Michonne sits outside the church and examines her katana, which she found in Martin's backpack. Gabriel sits down on the steps next to her and says that he can't sleep after everything that happened. Michonne tells him that although this feeling never goes away, it weakens over time. They are interrupted by a rustle coming from the forest. Gabriel returns to the church while Michonne goes to look around. As she walks slowly towards the tree line, she sees a few bushes rustle and Daryl appears. Michonne smiles at the sight of Daryl, but the smile disappears when she asks where Carol is. Daryl pauses, looks at her, then looks over his shoulder and tells someone they can go out. Beth wakes up in a hospital bed with her arm in a cast and stitches on her cheek. She gets up, looks out the window and discovers that she is in Atlanta. Beth knocks on the door, asking for help. A doctor and a policewoman enter the room and introduce themselves as Dr. Stephen Edwards and Officer Don Lerner. They inform Beth that she is at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, that she was found on the road with a broken wrist and that she was alone when she was found. Don says to Beth in an ominous tone, You owe us. Beth accompanies Stephen during his rounds. His first stop is the man they found under the bridge. He unceremoniously pulls out a fork and pierces his brain. He explains that resources are limited. If the patient does not get better almost immediately, they are forced to stop his treatment. They take the body and lower it down the elevator shaft to the basement. Stephen explains that if the body is still warm, then the rotters will take care of most of it. When Beth picks up a meal at a designated place, she runs into Gorman, who claims that he was the one who found and saved her. He reminds her that everything is worth something as long as she gets food, and suggests she be a little friendlier. On the way to Dr. Edwards' office, Beth passes Dawn's office and hears Dawn giving my lecture on how to do laundry. If you're safe enough to be bored, then you're lucky, Beth tells Dr. Edwards when he complains about his job. A new patient is brought to the ward, Gavin Trevith, who fell from a second-floor window. The officer who brought him in whispers to Dawn, who suddenly becomes much more interested. Dr. Edwards says it's a losing case, but Dawn insists he try anyway. The doctor shows Dawn his bruised stomach and that he is suffering from severe internal bleeding. When the doctor breaks the bad news, Dawn, in a rage, slaps Beth in the face, which reopens her sewn cheek. Dawn says, Steve, try to understand what's going on here. 
Dr. Edwards restitches Beth's cheek and leaves so she can put on a fresh shirt that Noah left for her. She finds a lollipop in her pocket and smiles. Beth and Dr. Edwards are called to a patient in the hallway, and they discover a woman, Joan, who has been bitten. Her arm needs to be amputated, but she refuses treatment and was caught trying to leave the hospital. Beth is forced to help hold her while the doctors saw off her arm. Beth goes to the laundry room with blood-stained clothes and meets Noah, who left her a lollipop. Beth wonders why Joan would try to escape and why she can't just work off her debt and leave. But he also informs her that they usually save people who are weak and unable to fight. They save them and force them to stay until they work off their debt, he implies that people can't really leave. Noah states that he is from a walled community in Richmond, Virginia, and he will leave when he has the opportunity. Dawn brings Beth some food, and Beth tells her she won't stay any longer than they make her. Dawn tries to convince her to stay in the hospital. She believes that the world will return to normal and it is important to maintain security and order. Try to look at the good things we're doing, she tells Beth. Beth eats the food, but doesn't seem to change her mind about leaving. Beth is humming to herself, wiping away the blood, in the ward of the recently amputated Joan, when Joan wakes up. She tells Beth that Dawn could control her men, but she doesn't because it's easier that way. She refuses to tell Beth what they did to her and tells her it doesn't matter. I think it's easier to make a deal with the devil when you're not paying the price. Back in her room, Beth searches for her lollipop under the mattress. Officer Gorman enters with it in his mouth. Something's lost. He offers Beth a taste and forcefully pushes it into her mouth. Dr. Edwards enters before the situation escalates. The girl was supposed to be mine, Gorman says. Dr. Edwards disputes this and his ownership of Joan, telling him that no one belongs to him. Dawn arrives, and Gorman threatens the doctor, saying that Dawn will not always be in charge. When they all leave, Beth asks the doctor why he's staying. In response, he leads her to the first floor. He taps the metal shutters with his pipe. The walkers attack immediately. He explains that with this state of the city, it will be almost impossible to leave. They go up to the roof and Edwards tells her how it all started. When Atlanta was destroyed, they began to exchange care for service. Dawn took care of him and ensured their safety. No matter how bad it is, it's still better than down there. Dr. Edwards tells Beth to check on Mr. Trevith and tells her to give him 75 milligrams of lozapine. Beth goes downstairs and gives the injection. But he also comes in just at the moment when Trevith begins to convulse and he loses consciousness. Lerner enters and stabs the dead man in the head with a knife, ordering him to remove the body. When Dawn demands to tell what happened, but also takes the blame, saying that he accidentally turned off the ventilator. Dawn orders an officer to take Noah to her office. When Beth tries to explain to Dr. Edwards what happened, he says, you gave him clonazepam, right? Beth is confused and hears Noah being beaten in the other room. Edwards tells her that she gave him the wrong medicine and he died of an overdose. Later, Dawn comes to Beth's room. She knows that Noah didn't turn off the ventilator. She says she had to beat Noah up for his dishonesty and to keep him in line. She goes on to tell Beth that she is not the ultimate good and therefore does not maintain her value. The wards make my officers happy. The happier my officers are, the harder they work to support us. Beth goes to visit Noah, who has received a lacerated eyebrow and a black eye. He says it's not as bad as it seems. He tells her that he knows that Trevid was important to Dawn for some reason. Beth says she'll leave with him. He tells Beth that he will distract Dawn while she searches for a spare key to the elevator. When they get a chance, Beth rummages through Dawn's desk drawers. She finds the wallet and discovers an ID card with the inscription of St. Ignatius Hospital on the back. Then she looks around and finds Joan's body on the floor. It turns out that she committed suicide by loosening the stitches on her amputation, and bled to death. In front of Joan are written in her own blood the words of the fact that she addressed to Gorman. Ignoring the corpse, she finds a spare key in a drawer just as Gorman enters. He offers to keep quiet if Beth is friendly. Beth looks around and sees that Joan is coming to life. She pretends to agree with Gorman and then smashes a jar of lollipops in his head, knocking him to the ground where Joan bites him. Beth grabs his gun and runs away. Seeing Dawn in the hallway, 
Beth tells her that Joan was looking for her and that she saw her and Gorman heading to her office. But Beth also runs to the elevator shaft, while screams come from Don's office. But he also lets Beth down into the mine on an improvised rope. As he descends the rope after her, the walker makes his way through the partially open elevator doors. He falls into a pile of bodies at the bottom of the mine. Beth jumps down after him. His leg is also injured, but he can limp. They barely get out of the basement to the parking lot and run past several cars with a white cross on the back window, it is implied that it was the hospital team that took Beth. New walkers appear on the other side of the fence. They climb through it, and Beth fights the walkers while it and squeezes through the gate on the other side. Beth, slowed down by walkers, is grabbed by Officer O'Donnell. Knocking her to the ground, she sees the window and runs away, and smiles. Dawn dresses Beth in her office, where Gorman's body lies on the floor. Beth claims self-defense. She blames Dawn for letting this happen. Dawn says she has to, but Beth says no one is coming, Dawn. Dawn looks at the floor and sees a broken photo of her and Hanson, after which she attacks Beth again and knocks her out. Later, Dr. Edwards examines the new stitches on Beth's forehead. When he leaves the room, Beth asks him, how did you know that Trevid was a doctor? Edward pauses, and Beth continues, that's why you made me give him the wrong drugs, right? Why did you make me kill him? Because if he had survived, there would have been another doctor, and Dolan wouldn't have needed you. Dr. Edwards admits that Trey Weed was a doctor at St. Ignatius Hospital. He says they would have kicked him out or killed him. He claims that when Christ was arrested, Peter denied that he was one of his disciples. He had no choice, they would have crucified him. He leaves the room. Beth picks up a pair of scissors and follows him, very angry, down the hallway. She clearly intends to harm him, she only stops when she sees Carol unconscious and on a stretcher. Abraham is riding along the road in a church bus. Rosita teases Abraham about having long hair, Abraham relaxes and jokes, and says he is thinking of becoming a plumber. He goes on to say that the successful completion of his mission is just around the corner. Rosita says she will cut Abraham's hair later that evening. Tara tells Eugene that his hair has become too long in the back and offers him a haircut. Tara asks Eugene what happened and he says he thinks about what that preacher did. Maggie tells Glenn that maybe Daryl and Carol are back and the others are walking behind. She turns around and asks Eugene how long it will take him to do it. Eugene replies that it depends on the density of infected around facilities around the world. Glenn asks Eugene why the hair. Eugene replies that because he likes them, and adds that no one will pick up scissors or wire cutters in the near future. Eugene says that the smartest person he has ever known, his former boss Brooks Alice, director of the Human Genome Project, loved his hair. When the bus passes by a group of walkers, a tire suddenly bursts. Abraham loses control, the bus swerves, crashes into another car and rolls over on its side. Walkers begin to approach the stationary bus. In a flashback, someone beats an unknown person to death with a tin can. The camera turns, and Abraham is seen striking. Abraham gets up and steps on the throat of the beaten man, killing him. The camera turns again and shows that they are in a grocery store, and several more bodies are lying on the floor. Abraham turns around and calls Helen's name. Returning to the overturned bus, Abraham calls Eugene while everyone on the bus begins to recover from the accident. As the engine burns, Abraham Glenn, Maggie and Rosita get out through the back door of the bus to fend off the walkers. Tara stays on the bus to protect Eugene. When a walker tries to get inside through the bus window, Tara stabs him and tells Eugene that it's time to be brave. Tara gives Eugene a knife and they both leave the bus. At first, Eugene just stands around in horror. However, when he sees a walker approaching Tara from behind, he rushes to him and stabs him, saving her. After all the walkers have been dispersed, Abraham yells orders to check Eugene if he is injured. Eugene says he's fine, but notices blood on Abraham's hand and asks if it's his blood. Abraham replies that yes, and that his cut has just reopened. Before they can get on the bus to pick up their supplies, the bus bursts into flames. Eugene suggests they return to the church, but Abraham insists that they should continue the mission. Abraham says that if they retreat, it will mean that they have lost. Glenn reassures him and confirms that he and Maggie will continue, 
no matter what. Abraham says he was badly injured in the accident. Tara says maybe they can find some bikes because the bikes don't burn. Eugene goes and looks at the walker he stabbed and spits on him. The group continues on foot. In the flashback scene, Abraham is in the grocery store and keeps calling someone named Helen. He stumbles through the aisles until he finds a woman and two children sitting behind the counter. Back in the present, Abraham and the group break into the bookstore. Once inside, they begin to equip the store, draw water in the toilet, build a barricade of bookshelves and tear pages out of books to use them for a bonfire. Rosita uses a thread from the spine of the book to sew up the wound on Abraham's arm. Abraham thanks Glenn for going with him. Glenn asks Abraham if he is going to bandage his hand, but Abraham replies that he will give her some air, since he cut her badly in church. Abraham says that all the living have become strong. He wants to say that killing someone is never easy, but that's not true. In fact, it's the easiest thing in the world right now. Glenn tells Abraham that it's time for him to go to bed and get some rest. Abraham replies that he needs some s first. After Abraham left, Glenn says I didn't need to know, but it's cool. When Abraham and Rosita have sex, Rosita looks up and says that Eugene is watching them again. Abraham laughs and says he's harmless. Tara approaches Eugene from behind, and Eugene admits that he was watching Abraham and Rosita. Eugene says that he likes the female form, and he considers it a victimless crime that allows for distraction. Tara says she was looking for Eugene to thank him for saving her life on the bus. Eugene says that he arranged a diversion so that the bus crashed. Eugene says that he put crushed glass in the fuel line back in the church, and that the vehicle should have failed even before it hit the road. When Tara asks why he did it, Eugene replies that he couldn't have survived alone. Eugene says if he couldn't save the world, there's no way they would have left him here. Tara says they will because they are friends. Tara says Eugene should keep what he did a secret and not do it again. Glenn is sleeping next to Maggie. He asks if she thinks about them, and Maggie replies that she feels guilty. Glenn jokes that he has a vacation on the floor of a bookstore. Maggie says it's just good, because it's not about what happened, but what will happen. In another flashback, Abraham tells Helen and the children that they are safe now. Helen is trembling, and the children are hiding behind her, they are clearly afraid of him. Abraham tells them that everything is fine, and then looks at his hands covered in blood. Rosita wraps Abraham's arm with bandages. She says she thinks they should stay here today, but Abraham says they need to move on. He says that every minute they lose to get Eugene to Washington, people are dying. Maggie enters and says that this store is almost untouched and that they can spend another day searching for supplies. Abraham says they have a car and looks out the window at the fire truck. He adds that there are 500 gallons of water in the car. At first the fire truck won't start, but eventually Abraham starts it. However, after they leave, the fire truck stalls. When Abraham starts working on the car, a tire rolls past them. Then a decent-sized group of walkers comes out of the building, freed after the fire truck moved forward and allowed the door of the building to open. Abraham and the others overtake them, but Eugene points a fire hose at the walkers and destroys them. Abraham says he's been to eight county fairs and one goat rodeo and has never seen anything like it. Glenn says there's goodwill where there might be some supplies. But Abraham doesn't want to wait, he climbs onto the roof of the fire truck to clean the engine air intake. Abraham begins to laugh when he sees on the ground the inscription let the sick inside die. In a flashback, Abraham wakes up on the floor of a grocery store. He looks around Helen and the children have disappeared. There's a note there don't try to find us. In desperation, he goes in search of them. Abraham and his group are now far down the road in a fire truck. Obviously, Abraham started the car, but it stalled again. Eugene is reading a book in the back seat of a fire truck. Glenn says he can smell something. The others also suddenly feel this smell. The group walks along a road where they see a horde of walkers and large farms equally infected on both sides. Glenn tells everyone that they should turn around and go back. Abraham says that he will not abandon the car, that they will be able to pass through the herd and that they will not turn around, not turn back. 
Rosita tells Abraham that the others are right, but he grabs Eugene and starts walking back to the fire truck. Everyone else tries to stop Abraham, but then Eugene starts shouting I'm not a scientist. Eugene says that he lied about being a scientist and knows how to stop walkers. Everyone is standing around and looking at him dumbfounded, and Rosita insists that he is a scientist. Eugene says he just knows something and is a good liar. He explains that he just wanted to get to the District of Columbia because he believes that this place has the best chance of survival. He just wanted to trick people into taking him there. Rosita reminds him that people died trying to get him to Washington. Eugene admits this and even lists a list of some in play Stephanie Lauren, PM Rex, Roger, Josiah, Dirk, Josephine and most recently Bob. Eugene says that as the reality of getting to Washington approached, he tried to slow them down. He also says that he lied about Brooks Ellis liking his hairstyle because he had never met him. When Eugene says he is smarter than them, Abraham loses his temper and hits Eugene twice, forcing him to climb into the fire truck. Abraham strikes again and hits Eugene's head into the windshield wiper and knocks him out. When Abraham lunges at Eugene again, Rosita stands in front of him and puts her hand on the gun. Maggie turns Eugene over and, together with Glenn and Rosita, tries to bring him to his senses. Abraham walks away and falls to his knees on the roadway with tears in his eyes. In the flashback, Abraham looks at the bodies, Helen and the children. He is about to commit suicide by shooting himself when he hears someone screaming for help. It's Eugene being chased by three walkers. Abraham kills the walkers and then starts to leave. Eugene calls him to stop, saying he can't leave. Abraham asks why, and Eugene says he has a very important mission giving him a new reason to live. The episode begins with a flashback of Carol leaving Rick in a station wagon right after she was kicked out of the band. Carol parks on the side of the road and sobs, clinging to the steering wheel. A walker approaches and starts beating on the window. She shouts at him to leave and drives away. Carol stops in front of a building that used to house a law firm. She goes inside and rattles the handles to check if there are any walkers inside. There is no answer, so Carol collects some empty bottles from the trash can to use them to store water. Later in the evening, Carol finishes reading the magazine and blows out the candle. She goes to bed with a gun in her hand. The next day, Carol is standing by the window, setting up plastic bags to collect rainwater. She notices a plume of smoke rising from the direction of the prison. Carol quickly gets into her station wagon and drives to the prison, presumably to find out if her old band needs help. At this time, Carol and Daryl are following a car with a white cross on the window. Carol asks Daryl about how he spent time with Beth after prison. She then suggests that they finish the search quickly by simply knocking the car off the road. Daryl is not convinced, believing that the driver may refuse to talk. He says they have the advantage now and if Beth is being held, they will do whatever is necessary to get her back. When the car enters the city, it stops. Daryl stops a few yards behind her, trying to be inconspicuous. The car sits motionless for a while, after which someone dressed in a police uniform comes out from the passenger side. Daryl notices that there are actually two people in the car, when suddenly a walker appears and starts banging on the car. The policeman starts grabbing bicycles and putting them in some kind of pile. Then he starts dragging something resembling a body. At some point, the policeman looks back at Daryl and Carol's car, then gets into his car. When the car leaves, Daryl tries to start the engine, but the gas tank is empty and the car won't start. Daryl tells Carol that they need to find some place to hold out until dawn. Carol says she knows a place a couple blocks away, then rolls down the window to hit the walker on the head. They find an office building and decide to take shelter for the night. Daryl finds the keys on the walker's body, which helps them unlock several doors inside the building. Daryl asks Carol if she used to work in this building or something similar. Carol answers something. And does not support the conversation. Daryl asks what kind of place it is, and Carol replies that it is a temporary accommodation. He asks if she came here, and Carol says she did, but not for long. They find a room with bunk beds, and Carol says she'll take the top bunk. Then she tells Daryl to get some rest because she has the first watch. When Daryl sits down on the bottom bunk, Carol asks, you said we'd start all over again, right? Daryl replies, I'm trying. He asks her what's really on her mind, and Carol replies that she thinks they won't save people anymore. 
Daryl asks, then why are you here? And Carol says I'm trying. Daryl asks what would have happened if he hadn't shown up when Carol was at the car, and Carol says she still doesn't know. She lies down next to Daryl on the lower bunk. Suddenly they hear a sound and Daryl grabs his crossbow. They both walk down a long corridor and sees a pair of child walkers and a female walker scratching with their claws on the other side of a glass door. Carol starts to enter the room with a knife, but Daryl tells her that this is not necessary. When Carol wakes up the next morning, smoke is rising outside. Daryl lit a fire. He carries the bodies of the children of the walkers in sheets and puts them in the fire. Carol goes outside and thanks Daryl. In the flashback, Carol digs a grave, and Iris carries the bodies of Lizzie and Mickey. Carol looks up and sees clouds of smoke in the distance. In the present, Daryl and Carol are packing up to go outside. Daryl says that they need to climb a tall building and look around for someone who has Beth. They go outside and stay close to the walls of the building. Daryl looks around the corner and sees several walkers on the roadway. He sees a bridge crossing connecting the two buildings and tells Carol that they can go up there. Daryl takes a notebook out of his backpack and sets it on fire. He throws it to distract the walkers. Then Daryl and Carol run past the walkers. They cross the covered parking lot and enter the building through the door. When the door closes behind Carol, the outline of a man watching her is visible between the cars. When Daryl and Carol try to cross the bridge between the buildings, they discover several walkers in sleeping bags and tents. Daryl shoots arrows at walkers in sleeping bags and stabs them, and they carefully bypass the walkers locked in tents. The camera focuses on the window behind the bridge, and in it you can see the outline of a man, the same one who watched them from the garage. Daryl and Carol climb through the hole in the door, which is chained. Daryl and Carol make their way into a room that looks like a supervisor's office. Carol looks out the window at the burned and destroyed city below. Carol says Daryl still hasn't asked her what happened after she met Tyrese and the girls. Daryl says he knows what happened, that they're not here, but Carol says it was even worse. Daryl says the reason he says they have to start over is because they have to do it. To hell with what happened, Daryl says. Carol agrees. Daryl notices something outside. He looks through the scope of Carol's rifle. He shows Carol the van wrecked on the bridge. There are two white crosses on the back window, and he thinks it might be a clue to who has Beth. Carol starts filling her canteen from the water cooler. Daryl looks at the painting and says he's willing to bet it cost a lot of money to some rich freak. Daryl says it looks like the dog sat in the paint and wiped his ass, but Carol says she even likes it. Daryl and Carol make their way back through a small hole in the door with chains. Carol pushes the rifle through the doorway and the first one goes outside. When Daryl is outside, the man who was watching them from the garage and from the window opposite the bridge turns out to be Noah, who is holding a rifle and watching both of them. But he also tells Daryl to put down his crossbow. But he also says that no one should get hurt, that he only needs their weapons. But he also tells them that they look strong and that they will be fine. Then he cuts the tents and lets the walkers out, after which he runs away. Daryl stabs one of the walkers, and Carol pulls out a gun and shoots. Carol points the gun at Noah's back, but Daryl pushes the gun away and she misses. They run after Noah, but he disappears. Carol asks Daryl if he thought she was going to kill him. Carol says she was aiming at his leg. Daryl says he was just a kid. Carol points out that he took their weapons, and without weapons, he and Beth could die. In a flashback, Carol burns Karen and David's bodies in prison. Back in the present, Daryl and Carol walk to the van on the bridge. The van is halfway from the edge of the bridge, and Carol notes that it is unstable. While they are searching the van, a horde of walkers is approaching it. Daryl notices hospital supplies in the van, and Carol says that Grady Memorial Hospital is nearby. As the walkers approach the van, Daryl stabs some of them, and Carol uses her last three bullets. However, they are overtaken by walkers, and they have to climb back into the van to escape. As they climb into the front of the van, Daryl tells Carol to buckle up as walkers push the van off the bridge. The van lands upside down. Daryl and Carol are stunned, but both are fine. Several walkers fall from a bridge onto a van. Daryl and Carol get out of the van and leave on foot. Daryl and Carol stop by some building to rest, 
and Daryl gives Carol water to drink. Carol's shoulder is injured, but she says it's been worse. Carol jokes that they had a good time going downstairs. She says they're only three blocks from Grady. Daryl and Carol enter the building, and Daryl finds a very weak walker on the floor, who is still holding a machete. He takes a machete and uses it to take down the walker. They're looking at the hospital. Daryl asks Carol that if he's not the same as before, what was he like before? Carol replies that he was a child, but now he is a man. Daryl asks, and you? Carol says that she and Sophia stayed at the shelter for a day and a half, and then she ran back to Ed. Carol says she was beaten up, but she didn't do anything. Carol says that the person she was when she was with Ed is burned out. She says that in prison she was able to become who she thought she always should have been, but then she burned down. Carol says everything is consuming you now. Daryl says we're not ashes. Daryl hears something, and they both go to sort it out. This is a walker who stuck to the wall like an arrow. Carol asks Daryl if it's his arrow, and Daryl says yes. They hear gunshots and, going around the corner of the corridor, sees Noah struggling with a walker. But he also breaks out, and the walker attacks Carol, but Daryl kills him. Daryl chases Noah and finds him trying to move a bookshelf that is blocking the door. Daryl pushes Noah into a bookshelf, and she falls back on Noah, pinning him down. A walker is trying to pass through the door, which was behind the bookshelf. Carol catches up with him, and Daryl and Carol take their weapons. But he also asks why they followed him, and begs them for help, but Daryl says that he already helped him once and it won't happen again. Daryl finds a pack of cigarettes and lights up. Carol yells at Daryl to help Noah, but Daryl tells him to leave him alone and leaves. The walker squeezes through the door and is about to grab Noah, but Daryl turns around at the last second and shoots an arrow at the walker. In the flashback, Carol is in the woods after an attack on Terminus. She falls to her knees and begins to wipe off the blood and guts of the walkers with which she smeared herself in order to get past the walkers and get inside. She picks up her weapon and starts walking, while smoke from Terminus billows in the background. Daryl and Carol pull Noah away from the bookshelves, but he also goes to the window and warns them that they, the people from the hospital, are coming now, because they probably heard the shot. Daryl asks him if he has seen a blonde girl in the hospital, and the other answers, Beth, do you know her? But also explains that Beth helped him escape, but she's still there. Carol notices one of the cars belonging to the hospital circling around the building below them. Daryl, Carol and others rush to run, trying to escape before the people from the hospital get there. But he also falls, Daryl stops to help him up, and Carol is the first to run out of the door, where she is instantly knocked down by a station wagon with a distinct white cross on the back. Daryl struggles, but also keeps him from going outside, and the couple witnesses Officer Odenil and Officer Alvarado load her onto a stretcher, carry her to the car and quickly drive back to the hospital. But she also says that they can help her, that they have medicines, devices, and a doctor. But he also claims that if Daryl had gone there, he would have had to kill them and then Carol would not have been able to get their help. Daryl asks Noah what needs to be done to get Carol and Beth back, the other replies, a lot, because they have guns and people. Daryl replies, and so do we. Daryl and the others escape through the fence and find the truck in which they leave. Daryl, Tyrese and Sasha strengthen the church by building barricades from the wreckage of the corpse Pargana's bench, while Gabriel watches the desecration with horror. Meanwhile, Michonne and Rick are clogging up the windows with boards. Michonne suggests Rick go to Atlanta instead, but Rick says he owes Carol. Rick, Daryl, Tyrese, Sasha, and other go to Atlanta. While Carl and Michonne board up the windows, Gabriel furiously scrubs the floor, trying in vain to remove the blood stains left after the massacre of Garrett's team. On the way to Atlanta, Tyrese tries to comfort Sasha in connection with Bob's death. Don't, she says. At the hospital, Beth walks into Carol's room and sees her lying unconscious in bed. Beth silently looks at Dr. Edwards when he comes to check on a patient. Elsewhere, Eugene is lying on the road, still unconscious from Abraham's beatings. Abraham is kneeling nearby and silently looks ahead. Rosita tries to give Abraham water, but he waves her off, then stands up and looms over her menacingly. Maggie points a gun at Abraham and orders him to sit down. At a warehouse in Atlanta, Rick plans an attack on a hospital. Tyrese suggests an alternative plan to kidnap two Dawn officers and arrange a prisoner exchange. Rick is skeptical that the plan will work, but agrees to it after Daryl gives him support. 
Back at the church, Carl lays out weapons in front of Gabriel and encourages him to choose one of them for self-defense. Noticing that Gabriel is worried about the massacre, Carl reminds Gabriel that Gareth and his men were liars and murderers, and Gabriel reluctantly chooses a machete. At the hospital, Beth listens as Officer O'Donnell suggests Dawn disconnect Carol from the life support machine to save resources. Beth protests, but Dawn takes O'Donnell aside. After O'Donnell leaves, Dawn privately instructs Beth to rescue Carol on her own and gives Beth the key to the medicine cabinet. Dawn then receives radio messages from Officer Shepard about shots being fired nearby and tells him to investigate with Officer Lamson. Back on the road, Maggie stays with Eugene and Abraham while the rest of the group goes to replenish water supplies in a nearby stream. On the way, Tara defends Eugene for being weak and defenseless. He had one skill that helped him survive, she argues. Should we really be mad at him for taking advantage of him? Near the truck, Maggie builds an awning over Eugene to shelter him from the sun. She then rushes to Abraham, who is still kneeling in a catatonic pose. Come to terms with yourself, she says. You're not the only one who lost something today. At the hospital, Beth visits Dr. Edwards and asks him what medication he would inject Carol with. He advises 5 milligrams of epinephrine. After discovering that the water in the stream is polluted, Rosita creates a water filter using a technique she learned from Eugene. To everyone's surprise, Glenna discovers fish in the stream. Meanwhile, Shepard and Lamson investigate the shots and find No and in the alley. When they grab him, Rick's group ambushes them and holds them at gunpoint. But a hospital car arrives at the scene with another officer, Lakari, and rescues Shepard and Lamson. Rick's group opens fire and pursues the officers, eventually catching all three. Rick's group brings the captured officers to the warehouse. Shepard explains that their hostage plan won't work because Dawn doesn't consider them valuable because of their plot to overthrow her. Lamson, however, assures Rick that the deal will work if they talk to Dawn properly. Let me help you, he offers, declaring his kinship with Dawn. At the creek, Glenn, Rosita and Tara kill walkers, and make a fishing net out of their clothes. After successfully catching a fish, Glenn tells Rosita that wherever their group is, they will need her skills, and asks if she agrees. I'm in, she says. At the church, Michonne checks on Gabriel in the abbess room. He pretends to be tired and leaves. Left alone, he resumes his work, knocking down the floorboards with a machete, wanting to secretly leave the church. At the hospital, Beth asks an assistant to distract attention while she steals epinephrine from the medicine cabinet and injects it to Carol. Returning to the church, Gabriel escapes by going down under the floor. Getting out, he accidentally steps on a nail, but then, saving steps, goes into the forest. At the warehouse, Lamson advises Rick to negotiate with Dawn. He explains that Dawn won't agree to the hostage deal at first, but then she will eventually agree. The face thanks Lamson and offers him water. Gabriel limps through the woods and is attacked by a walker. He knocks him down and picks up a stone to kill him, but then notices a crucifix around his neck. With tears in his eyes, he lowers the stone and hobbles away. While Sasha is guarding Lamson, he says that he saw a former colleague who turned into a walker melt into the asphalt on the street. Sympathizing, Sasha offers to shoot the walker to put an end to his suffering. On the road, Eugene finally wakes up, and Maggie hurries to him. Glenn, Tara and Rosita return with fresh fish and water. Tara finds Yo-Yo. Back at the warehouse, Lamson directs Sasha to the window and tells her where to point the gun. While she is looking through the scope, Lamson hits Sasha's head against the window. When Sasha is lying on the ground, bleeding and unconscious, Lamson runs away. Rick runs, and Bob tries to free himself from the handcuffs. Rick jumps into a police car and quickly catches up with him. He gets into the car and warns Bob to stop. Bob ignores the warning and Rick hits him with the car. Bob says his back is broken and begs to go back to the hospital. Rick refuses, to which he replies that the group is doomed and they will die trying to take over the hospital. Rick shoots him in the head and tells him to shut up. At the school where the Terminus residence camp used to be located, walkers gather at the door while Father Gabriel inspects the scene. He finds photographs, a Bible with Mary's name on the inside cover, and finally the remains of Bob's leg in the barbecue pit. He angrily overturns the pit and cries. While he is doing this, the walkers are released and chase him. He heads into the forest, where he leans against the tree on which the incision was made. 
He continues walking towards the church and briefly stops in front of a familiar place where his parishioners were trying to get inside when they were surrounded by walkers. Gabriel calls Carl and Michonne to let him in, as the walkers begin to push against the barriers set up by the survivors. Michonne has to chop down the wooden board that closes the door, but she manages to open it just in time. A small horde of walkers makes their way inside, and Carl Ridiculous begins to destroy them. However, they are quickly overtaken, and they retreat to the church office. Gabriel directs Carl, who is carrying Judith, to the hole in the floor that he used to escape, followed by Michonne and Gabriel himself. Outside, they deal with walkers, and then board up a church with zombies locked inside. Rick returns to the old building and tells the group that he had to kill Bob. The other two officers explain that if Dawn finds out how he was killed, she will take it personally. So they agree to tell Dawn that Bob was taken by walkers. This will allow Rick to get inside with minimal violence. Back at the hospital, Dawn continues to try to contact her officers by radio. Beth asks her if anything is wrong, and they chat a little while Beth cleans Dawn's office. In the office, she finds a picture of Dawn with Captain Hansen, the officer who used to be in charge. Dawn says that he was her mentor and friend, and that she misses him. Beth asks what happened, and Dawn tells her that he has lost sight of the risk-benefit ratio of the operation and the officers below him have stopped supporting him. In the church, Carl and Michonne sit with Gabriel and Judith and wait. Gabriel admits that he went to school to make sure they were telling him the truth. Walkers begin to enter through the boarded-up doors, but before they can do so, Abraham's group appears in a fire truck and drives right into the doors. Maggie informs them that Eugene lied about Washington. Then Michonne informs Maggie that Beth is alive, she is being held at the Great Memorial. The group collectively decides to go after her. At the hospital, Odinil begins to scold Percy for not sewing up the hole on his sleeve properly. Beth looks at it. Oh, Donal asks if she knows how to sew, but Dawn calls her off. Beth sits on the edge of the elevator shaft and looks down. Dawn arrives and they begin to discuss the situation. Beth expresses disappointment that Dawn insists it won't always be like this and tells her that the world won't magically get better. In the course of it, Donal finds them talking. He says it's time to change something, that either Dawn admits the situation to the rest of the officers, or he will do it. She points a gun at him and they fight. He chases her, knocks her gun down the elevator shaft, and they fight. He begins to get the better of her, and Beth comes to the rescue. When he is distracted by her, it gives Dawn the opportunity to regain the advantage, and the two of them dump him into the mine. Dawn comes to Carol's room, where Beth is leaning against the wall. Dawn tells her it's okay to cry, and Beth replies that she's not crying anymore. Dawn drinks and Beth tells her that she didn't cover for Beth to protect her, she did it to protect herself. Beth tells her that she's going to leave as an other, but Dawn says she won't come back, they always come back and that she knows Beth knows Carol, and that they both have to stay. She tells Beth that the two dirty cops she had a hand in killing were bad people, and the world lost nothing when they died. Sasha has a sniper rifle on the roof next to the hospital. Tyrese doesn't want her to blame herself for Bob's betrayal and death. He tells Sasha a story about how he pretended that he wanted to kill Martin, but could not, and then he appeared in the church, in the end Sasha killed him. He tells Sasha that maybe the world hasn't changed them and that's a good thing. She replies that it's good that Tyrese has stayed the same, but she can't be like that anymore. Later, Daryl joins her on the roof. Rick is on the street below and approaches the police car with his hands up. He calls them by name and introduces himself, he says he has come to make an offer. He is told to lay down his weapons, and he does so, but the snipers point their sights at the police officers' heads. The officers approach Rick and he offers an even exchange two people for two people. When the officers ask where Rick's men are, Sasha destroys the walker with one shot from a sniper rifle. Rick says they're close, and that he'll wait until they get in touch on the radio. Back at the hospital, Beth changes into her usual clothes, hiding the scissors in her wrist. Carol has already woken up, and Beth takes her out into the corridor, where all Don's officers are standing, followed by Dr. Edwards. Rick and his group are taken out into the corridor and everyone collectively holsters their weapons. Two policemen, as promised, lie about Lamson's death. They change Lakari to Carol, and then Shepard to Beth. When the group is about to leave, 
Dawn decides to change the deal and demands that Noah stay too. She says the officers died trying to save him. When Rick starts to object, but also voluntarily agrees to stay, Beth goes to hug him goodbye, and when Dawn tells him I knew you'd be back. Beth, concerned about this statement, approaches Dawn and says now I understand, after which she stabs her with scissors, but this leads to Dawn instinctively shooting Beth in the head, killing her. Daryl, ignoring Dawn's shock and her plea for mercy, shoots Dawn in the head in response, killing her. The officers and Rick's group pull out guns and point them at each other, but Shepard orders the cops to retreat, ending the standoff. Rick's group is devastated and cries at the sight of Beth's body lying on the ground next to Dawn's body. Shepard, supported by Edwards, offers Rick and the group to stay in the hospital, but Rick refuses, offering instead to take everyone from the hospital who wants to leave, but also decides to leave the hospital with Rick's group. When the group leaves the hospital, Rick shakes his head in Glenn's direction, trying to show what happened. Daryl carries Beth's body out of the building, Maggie sees it and falls to the ground, crying tears, and Glenn comforts her, also crying. The whole group stands in silence and sorrow. Morgan finds his way out of the woods and stands where Gabriel used to stand in front of the school. He stops over a walker who is lying on the ground, and relieves him of his suffering, and goes on to the church. There he sets up an altar and sits down to pray. After that, he looks around at the carnage and laughs until he finds Abraham's note for Rick on a map of Washington, D.C. Seventeen days have passed since Beth's death. Maggie and others are still coping with Beth's unexpected death. After leaving the hospital, Rick, Glenn, Daryl, Tyrese and Sasha go to get supplies. Rick checks the truck and takes it for a trip to Virginia. Places of significance to Tyrese flash by several times a small house referring to a hut in a grove, a prison and Woodbury. Several photos of Noah and his twin brothers are also shown. When night falls, but also tells Rick to have to go with him from the hospital to accompany him to the community where his family lives. Rick asks where it is, the other one tells him it's not far from Richmond, Virginia. Even though it's far away, Rick decides to tell the rest of the group that the place Noah mentioned will be their next destination. This place was guarded when it left it, surrounded by a wall and was home to 20 people. It's a long journey, but if everything works out, then it's the last one we have to make, says Rick. Glenn asks, what if he's gone? Rick says that they will continue on their way, but then Michonne compliments him, who says, then we will find a new place. Rick, Michonne, Glenn, Tyrese, Otho go to where Noah lived. Rick radioed Carol to tell her they were almost there. Carol tells Rick that if they don't come back, the others will come looking. But Tyrese also talks about their families. Tyrese mentions her father and Sasha, and it says that it hopes to see its own in the community, and Tyrese replies that he hopes so too. They park about two miles out of town near a bullet-riddled station wagon that crashed into a covered pickup truck. They cautiously drive up to Shurult States, Rick is afraid of snipers, but but calms him down. When the gate comes into view, but also rushes to them and tries to open them, but they are locked. They hear some sounds from inside, and Glenn climbs the wall to look inside, but they see that the settlement has been destroyed. But he also panics and climbs over the wall to see the destruction. But he breaks down in tears, and Rick and the others follow him. Tyrese comforts him, saying that everything will be fine, that he is with them now. Rick intervenes and tells Noah that he is truly sorry for what happened. Rick radioed Carol and informed her that the place had disappeared. Rick, Michonne and Glenn go to see what they can find. Rick and Glenn discuss the events at the hospital and their shared desire to kill Dawn, despite the random nature of Beth's death. Glenn confesses to Rick that, given everything they've been through, if he had the chance to do it all over again, he wouldn't stop to try to save a man locked in a storage container in Terminus and would kill Dawn without hesitation. Meanwhile, Noah is still grieving, and Iris stays with him and tells her own story of loss, but comes to the conclusion that if not for his persistence, Judith would not be alive today. He tells Noah that it's not over yet. Then Noah gets up and sees his old house from afar. He runs towards him, and Iris chases after him. Upon entering the house, they find Noah's mother dead in the living room, her head smashed by some blunt object, but also falls on her side and asks for forgiveness, from Iris goes in search of the sound he heard from the bedroom. In the bedroom, he is distracted by the photos of Noah's brothers on the wall and is suddenly bitten by a walker. 
but he also rushes into the room and kills the walker, after which he convulsively tells Tyrese that he will go after the others. Tyrese starts hallucinating. He sees Martin from Terminus, who taunts him that he is dying and that he didn't kill him when he had the chance in the hut. He says that if he did, Bob might be alive today, Beth might be alive. Bob then appears and reminds Tyrese that he was bitten at the food bank. A voice is heard on the radio announcing terrible news. The governor appears and reminds Tyrese how he said he would do everything he could to make a living when he first arrived in Woodbury. Then Mika and Lisa appear to console Tyrese, but the governor refutes their words. Tyrese emerges from a hallucination when the figure he saw as the governor turns into a walker who starts attacking him. Tyrese quickly puts him down, but he manages to bite his hand and falls to the floor. In the backyard of the community, near a destroyed wall surrounded by severed legs and arms, Michonne expresses her idea to stay in a neighboring settlement, but Rick is against it. She argues that they should go to Washington DC, where they might have a chance. After a while, Rick agrees. At this moment, a cry for help is heard, and the group runs to save him from several walkers who cornered him. He reports that Tyrese has been bitten, and they set off in the direction of his house. Beth appears in the house as part of Tyrese's hallucination, playing guitar and singing, while Mika and Lizzie sit in front of her. Beth tells Tyrese that everything is fine and that he needs to know it now. The governor scolds him for letting Carol live after what she did to the woman he loved. He points at the governor and declares that he is dead, that everything in him is dead, and that he has forgiven Carol because this is not the end. Micah and Lizzie take Tyrese's hand before it turns out that it's Rick holding his bloody hand so that Michonne amputates it to stop the spread of infection. The group drags Tyrese out of the house to the front gate. They break the locks and open the doors, walkers rush in. They quickly deal with them and carry Tyrese all the way to the car. As they run, Tyrese has flashbacks of the horrors he saw, Sasha kills Martin, and Carol shoots Lisa. Tyrese weakens by the time they get to the car, and Rick radioed Carol that she needs to cauterize her hand to stop the bleeding. After a slight hitch due to the fact that the car got stuck in the mud and then crashed into a covered pickup truck, they manage to hit the road. Tyrese is having another hallucination. Beth drives the car, Bob sits in the passenger seat, and Mika and Lizzie sit next to him and comfort him. Tyrese takes one last look at them all, looks out of the car window and dies peacefully, admiring the sunset. Realizing that he has passed away, they stop and pull him out of the car onto the road, and Michonne lays him on the ground while the others are in confusion. Gabriel reads lines from the Bible, and the others stand over the place of his burial. Daryl looks extremely saddened, and Sasha is visually shocked by the death of his brother, and Rick, furious that he has lost another friend, the very man who saved his daughter. Maggie is sitting in the woods crying, obviously because of Beth. The walker slowly makes his way to her through the bushes and comes dangerously close, but gets stuck between two trees. Maggie quickly deals with him with her knife. Meanwhile, Daryl digs up a worm and eats it, implying that the group is on their way without supplies. Sasha walks along a dried up stream in search of water. She notices a few dead frogs, which indicates that there is not enough water. The three of them return to the others who are waiting on the road. Maggie notes that it is unlikely that the rest of the band members were more lucky. They have gone a day and a half without food and water, and the whole group is weak and exhausted. How long do we have left? Maggie asks out loud. 60 miles, Sasha answers stupidly, referring to the distance to Washington. That's not what I was talking about, Maggie says grimly. After driving a little more, the group's car runs out of fuel. They leave her on the road and continue on foot. Eventually they overtake a small pack of walkers who follow them from a distance. Rick tells Daryl that he thinks they should try to find a position on high ground before dealing with the walkers. Carl gives Maggie a music box as a reminder of Beth. Gabriel's father offers Maggie his consolations, but she rejects them and says that he did not know Herschel or Beth, so he cannot understand her pain. She then reminds Gabriel of his own sins, especially when he saved himself at the expense of his parishioners. The group continues to move along the road, hungry and dehydrated. Sasha, still angry at the loss of his brother Tyrese, wants to fight the walkers. Michonne disagrees, warning Sasha that she shouldn't let her anger get the better of her, as Tyrese did after Karen's death. Sasha angrily objects that she and Tyrese are not alike. Daryl and Carol separate from the group in search of food and water. 
Carol says that Beth saved her life in Atlanta, as well as Daryl's life, and gives Daryl Beth's knife. Eventually, they reach an overpass with a steep ravine on either side. Rick, along with Glenn, Maggie, Michonne, Sasha and Abraham, tries to destroy a group of walkers by luring them on both sides of the road, and then pushing them into a ravine. However, Sasha starts stabbing walkers with his knife, which forces the group to do the same. During the fight, Sasha becomes so purposeful that she almost injures Michonne and accidentally cuts Abraham's hand. Ricky is almost bitten by a walker, but Daryl returns and saves him. After the walkers are dead, Michonne makes a remark to Sasha, who in response looks at her with an angry challenge. The group goes on to find some abandoned cars. Maggie finds a bound and gagged female walker in the trunk, who painfully reminds her of Beth, after which Glenn kills her. Daryl continues to walk through the woods in search of provisions. He encounters the remains of a deer, decomposing and half-eaten, presumably by a walker. He also notices the corpse of a man nearby, who seems to have committed suicide. Daryl wonders if he should take the deer, but decides to leave and return to the others. The group is resting on the side of the road. Abraham starts drinking alcohol from a bottle, and the others look at it. Tara points out to Rosita that he is only making the situation worse. Rosita says Abraham knows about it. Eugene says that Abraham knows what he's doing and the situation can't be worse than it is now, but Rosita disagrees. Their conversation is interrupted when a group of wild dogs appears from the forest. They see the group and start growling and barking threateningly. The whole group is tense in anticipation of a fight, but Sasha quickly deals with the dogs with a rifle. Everyone is sitting motionless, clearly surprised by her actions. Rick calmly stands up and takes a branch. Breaking it into two parts, he strands pieces of dog meat on a skewer and cooks them over an open fire. But he also refuses to eat the meat of hounds, looking at the collar of one of the dogs with visible stupefaction. Sasha approaches him, and he tells her that Tyrese tried to help him and that he is not sure he can handle it. So you can't do it, Sasha says sternly. Don't think, just eat, she adds before leaving. Meanwhile, Gabriel takes off his clerical collar and throws it into the fire. The group keeps going. During the walk, Glenn offers Maggie a drink of water, but she refuses. Then Glenn asks her to just talk to him. Maggie explains that after Herschel's death, she didn't really hope that Beth was alive, but after she learned from Michonne that she was alive, she regained hope. However, after she finds out that Beth was killed on the same day, she doesn't know if she wants to keep fighting to survive. Glenn assures her that she can, because she's a fighter. Glenn offers her a drink again, and she accepts it. Meanwhile, Sasha passes by Abraham, who is still drinking his liquor. He offers Sasha to share a drink with him, but she refuses, saying that he only makes the situation worse. After Maggie drinks her portion of water, Glenn offers the bottle to Daryl, who refuses. Daryl separates from the group, goes into the forest and sits down under a tree. A small shed can be seen in the distance. Daryl smokes a cigarette, lost in dreams. He deliberately burns his hand with a cigarette, but does not show pain, and eventually breaks down in tears. The group finds a stack of bottled water in the middle of the road. Daryl joins them, and Rick shows him a note with an inscription from a friend. The whole group fears it could be a trap. Eugene disagrees and says that, in his opinion, it really is from a friend. He grabs one of the bottles and is about to drink it when Abraham pushes him away. Soon after, it starts raining from the sky. The whole group rejoices, except for Daryl, Maggie and Sasha, who are still devastated by the death of their loved ones and emotionally numb, and Gabriel, who asks God for forgiveness for doubting him. The jubilant celebration is interrupted when the group sees a strong thunderstorm rapidly approaching. Daryl tells the others that he has found a shed nearby and leads them to the shed to take shelter. When they clean out the barn, Maggie finds a walker who was the girl who died. After Maggie stabs the walker, Carol joins her, and Maggie notices that the girl had a gun and says she could have just shot herself. Carol tells Maggie that some people can't give up like them. Night falls and the group rests in the barn while a storm rages outside. Maggie is lying by the fire, Sasha is sitting with Abraham looking after her with liquor in hand, and Rick is telling the group a story from his childhood about his grandfather who fought in World War II. Rick often asked him if he had ever killed Germans during the war, but he did not answer. And when he asked him if the Germans had tried to kill him, Grandpa fell silent. Rick's grandfather told him that he had been dead since the moment he entered enemy territory, and that every day when he woke up, 
he always told himself, rest in peace, and now get up and go to war. And then, after several years of pretending to be dead, he managed to get out alive. I think that's the trick, concludes Rick. We tell ourselves that we are, the walking dead. Daryl disagrees, saying, we are not them. The face tries to assure him that this is really not the case. Rising to his feet, Daryl repeats we are not them and walks away from the fire. Some time later, when Daryl is standing at the entrance to the barn, he hears a noise outside. He looks out and sees a herd of walkers approaching the barn in the rain. Daryl instinctively blocks the door, Maggie notices, understands what is happening, and helps him. The walkers start trying to push the door out. Rick and the others realize what's going on, and everyone rushes to help Daryl and Maggie. While the herd continues to press on the group, the group itself continues to fight for its own survival. Carl puts Judith crying on the ground and helps. While the storm is raging outside, the groups and the herd are fighting each other through the barn door. Everyone is doing everything possible not to let the herd inside. The next morning, everything is calm, and Maggie wakes up and sees that Daryl is still awake. She sits down next to him and talks to him, telling him that he needs to get some sleep and that he can rest now. They look at Sasha, who is sleeping against the far wall. He was cool, Daryl remarks, referring to Ayers. Maggie agrees. So is she, Daryl adds, talking about it. She didn't know it, but she was like that. Daryl hands Maggie the music box that Carl gave her, saying that he fixed it. Then she will be Sasha and they leave the hut. They discover that because of the strength of the hurricane, all the walkers were either killed or immobilized, crushed by trees or impaled on them. The scale of the destruction is such that Sasha is surprised that the shed was not destroyed either. Then Maggie and Sasha sit on a fallen tree and watch the sunrise together. As they sit, Sasha tells Maggie about what Noah said about himself, that he doesn't know if he can survive. Sasha admits that she feels the same way, but Maggie assures her that she will survive. Maggie tries to play the music box, but discovers that the box is still broken. The women laugh at this, but their conversation is interrupted by a man named Aaron, who asks them if he can talk to the main one, and calls Rick's name. The women, confused, pull out their guns and ask how he knows about Rick. Maggie and Sasha bring Aaron to the barn, where the rest of the group is resting. Rick and the others seem wary of Aaron's appearance. Maggie gives Rick Aaron's gun, which Rick keeps for himself, asking Aaron about his intentions. He informs the group that he was following them and that it was he who supplied them with water bottles the day before. Vic decides not to believe him and convinces the group that Aaron has other intentions. Aaron, knowing that he will be believed, asks Sasha to give Rick his backpack, directing him to a small set of photos of his community that he took as proof of its existence. When Aaron explains what his community is and stresses its safety, Rick punches him in the face, knocking him out. Since Aaron is unconscious, Rick sends a group to observe the area. Michonne tries to convince Rick that Aaron is not a threat, but Rick insists that he cannot be trusted. Glenn informs Rick that there are many places where enemies can hide, which causes even more panic in the group. When Aaron comes to, he keeps a positive attitude and jokingly praises Rick's strength. Rick replies that you can't trust someone who laughs after being beaten. Rick asks Aaron about the number of people waiting for his group. Aaron replies that it doesn't matter if he told him about the number of people, as it won't affect whether he trusts him more than he trusts. Rick insists that he confess anyway, and Aaron informs him that there is only one. Aaron also reports that he and his accomplice have cars that they tried to drive to the barn, but they were prevented by trees. Michonne tells Rick that she wants to find out the truth by checking it out. Rick refuses, saying it's a bad idea, but after Maggie and Glenn speak out in favor, Rick decides to let everyone but him and baby Judith go on a reconnaissance mission, ordering Abraham and Rosita to go with Glenn, Maggie and Michonne, and the rest of the group to search the neighborhood. When the group leaves, Aaron tells Rick that before the apocalypse, guns were pointed at him because of his work and that he believes that he and his people are good. Instead, Rick warns Aaron that if his men don't return in an hour, he will stick a knife into the base of his skull. Michonne, Maggie, Glenn, Rosita and Abraham are still on their way to their destination. Glenn warns the others to shoot whoever comes out of the woods if the time comes. Disagreeing, Michonne says that Arn's people, not bad people, reminding him how they saved Gabriel, how they saved Tara after her affair with the governor, 
and how they saved a crazy woman with a sword, implying themselves. Glenn reluctantly agrees. They get to the specified location, find the car and van and realize that Aaron was telling the truth. A pair of walkers come out of the woods, one of them almost bites Abraham until Rosita intervenes. In the barn, baby Judith starts crying. Aaron, still tied to the barn's support, reminds Rick that her crying will attract a lot of walkers to their location and that if that happens, he will be the first to die because of his immobility. Aaron insists that Rick take the applesauce so that Judith won't cry. Still doubting Aaron's intentions, Rick takes out a spoonful of applesauce from the supplied jar and offers it to Aaron, telling him to eat it first as a precaution. Aaron, realizing what he is doing, and, offended, refuses, saying that poisoning the child would be the last thing he would ever do. Rick, however, insists, even after Aaron informs him that he doesn't like applesauce. Against his wishes, he eats it. Realizing that it's safe, Rick rushes back and shares the sauce with Judith. Rick reminds Aaron that he has 43 minutes left. Abraham and Rosita are cleaning the van. He then talks to Rosita about what happened to Eugene, asking if she believes he could have harmed her. Rosita replies that no, and that she is sure it wasn't him. The group returns to the barn with a bunch of canned food from the cars. Rick tells Aaron that the food is now at their disposal, regardless of whether they come to his camp or not, and eventually decides that they will stay. The group, which by this time hopes for a new shelter, refuses to follow Rick's decision not to follow Aaron into his community, which forces Rick to change his mind. Rick asks Aaron where his community is. After Aaron informs the group that he is usually the one who takes the survivors to the place, they deny him this privilege, still fearing his true intentions, and again ask him where his community is located. After reporting the location, Aaron also tells Rick about the best route to the community. However, Rick decides to go the other way. Iron warns him that the path he has chosen will not be safe, as it has not been cleared in advance. Rick insists that they will go his way to avoid trouble. Soon after, Rick and Michonne discuss the situation at the barn. At the same time, Rick expresses his doubts about Aaron's community and reminds Michonne of the deception of Woodbury and Terminus, saying that both places were initially silent about their true motives. At night, the group goes to the community. Michonne and Aaron talk on the way, during which Aaron mentions his house. Michonne, on the restless, asks a question about it. Aaron gives her photos of his house, and when she realizes that there are no people in the pictures, she is alarmed and asks Rick if he asked Aaron these three questions. Since Rick answers in the negative, Michonne takes on this role and asks him questions. How many walkers have you killed? I don't know, a lot. How many people have you killed? Two. Why? Because they tried to kill me. The conversation is interrupted when Rick finds the walkie-talkie that Aaron used to eavesdrop on the group's conversations, right before the car drives through a herd of walkers in the dark, the blood of walkers turns the car and headlights red. The car continues to ram the herd, after which the group stops and goes out to check if the others have fallen behind. Glenn reports that they got out. Lick rushes back, and Glenn tries to start the car, but he can't do anything because of the huge amount of dried blood in the engine. The group stops for a moment when a lighted flare is seen in the distance. Aaron starts to panic. He frantically asks to be released, but after the group continues to seek answers from him, he begins to run amok, kicks open the door and knocks Michonne down. When he runs away, Rick assures them that they don't need to chase him. Michonne suggests that the rest of the group may have also seen the flash and thought it was Rick, and believes that it will be easier to find them that way. Rick and Glenn follow Michonne into the woods, becoming trapped where they are surrounded by walkers. In the end, Glenn separates, which causes panic among the remaining two members of the group, who are forced to restrain the approaching walkers themselves. While Glenn is trying to find a way to get back to the others, he discovers Aaron cornered by walkers unable to defend himself. Initially deciding to leave him, Glenn changes his mind, helps him and frees him. Eventually Glenn and Aaron reunite with Rick and Michonne, destroying the remaining walkers. Aaron, well aware of the group's opinion of him, throws down his weapon and offers to retreat. Then all four of them run to the place from where the signal rocket was supposedly fired. When they reach the place, they find Daryl. Aaron, however, is still in a panic and starts calling for a man named Eric. Running into one of the nearby buildings, he finds Eric with a wounded leg. 
Eric tells Aaron that Maggie helped him and assures him that his wound is very minor. Delighted, Aaron kisses him. Eric gives Aaron the license plate, noting that he has lost it, Aaron jokingly informs him about the loss of the car. Their conversation is interrupted by the appearance of Rick. Then Rick and Aaron meet with the others, while Aaron thanks them for saving Eric and promises to return everything completely as soon as they get to his community. Rick informs him that if they sleep under the same roof, then Aaron should sleep separately from them. Realizing that he will be away from Eric, Aaron refuses, telling Rick that the only thing that can prevent him from staying with him is to shoot him. Glenn convinces Rick that everything will be fine and that Aaron can be trusted, since all the evidence so far has confirmed that he is telling the truth. The next morning, the group continues on their way to the community, but also gives Aaron pills and a bottle of water for Eric. The two strike up a conversation, with Aaron asking Noah about his leg as well. But he also tells Aaron that it happened after a previous accident. Aaron, showing sympathy for his condition, offers him the help of Pete, a doctor from his community who has done many incredible things. On the way, Rosita points to the Washington Monument, which is visible from afar. The city of Washington appears to the eye, completely virgin and almost untouched by the apocalypse. Abraham grins and tells Rosita that they will get there, despite the low battery in the van and the fact that they are only halfway to the goal. Shortly after, the van breaks down, much to Abraham's dismay. Glenn helps fix the problem by replacing the dead battery with a spare one in the van. Surprised, Abraham asks how he found out about this, to which Glenn only smiles in response. Rick is watching from afar, Michonne is sitting next to him. She tells him that he should leave his worries as their battles are over. Rick says he still doesn't believe Aaron and Eric, and then declares that no matter what happens, he wants to make sure because his family is at stake. Before leaving, Rick stops at an old hut, takes a bowl from a blender and hides Aaron's confiscated pistol in it, taking it with him as a security measure. The group reaches the safe zone of Alexandria. Rick waits warily, stopping in front of the gate, but is relieved to hear the sounds of children playing from behind the gate, assuring him that the territory is safe. Turning to Rick, Michonne asks him if he is ready, to which he replies that he is. Everyone gets out of the cars and goes to the closed gate. While Rick keeps Judith by his side, the group waits for their new hideout to open. Rick's group passes through the main gate of Alexandria. They are met by a security guard, Nicholas, who orders them to hand over their weapons. They refuse, and Rick tries to reason with them, saying they're not even sure if they're going to stay, but Aaron intervenes and insists they can keep the guns until they talk to community leader Diana Monroe. In a well-furnished living room, Dina videotapes Rick, asking him about his band. She explains that Alexandria used to be an environmentally sustainable community with its own solar grid, cisterns, and ecological filtration and wastewater. Rick asks Dina, a former congresswoman from Ohio, what she wants. I want you to help us survive, she replies. Rick's men hand over their weapons to Olivia, who runs the armory. Olivia says they can take guns when they go outside the walls. Carol pretends to have difficulty taking the rifle off her shoulders, and then dutifully puts it on the pile, exchanging friendly smiles with Olivia. Aaron takes Rick and Carl to the group's designated home's two picturesque colonial houses next door to each other. Inside, Rick and Carl find spotlessly clean rooms with running water. Rick takes a hot shower and shaves off his overgrown beard. One of Jesse's neighbors comes in with a basket of groceries and toiletries from the city pantry. Noticing his unkempt hair, Jesse offers Rick a haircut. During the haircut, she mentions that she has two children, Ron and Sam. Ron is the same age as Carl and suggests they meet. During a conversation with Daryl, Diana asks if he wants to stay in Alexandria. He evades the question, but says that Carl and Judith deserve a good home. Carl and Carol explore the second house. Carol suspects that Dina just wouldn't give up such a luxurious home. She meets Rick and Daryl on the front lawn. They worry about splitting the group between the two houses and agree that they should all sleep in the same house. That evening, when the group is preparing beds on the floor in the living room, Diana comes in. Sticking together, she notes, is smart. Rick notices that she hasn't assigned him a job yet. Deanna says she has a job for him but she's still trying to figure out funny with Sasha and Daryl. That night, Rick finds that he can't sleep. He goes to the kitchen and takes a knife from the drawer. The next day, Diana interrogates Michonne, 
who says that the group is ready to join the community. Meanwhile, the group leaves their home to explore the neighborhood. Rick persuades Daryl to join them, but he decides to stay away. As they walk, Rick loses sight of Carl and Judith. In a panic, he finds Jesse, who leads him to a nearby house where Carl and Judith are sitting on the porch with two elderly people who are caring for Judith. Jesse calls them Bob and Natalie, whose family before the apocalypse consisted of five children and twelve grandchildren, and remarks that Judith will have to endure a lot of attention, since few people in Alexandria have seen the child for a long time. Jesse also suggests getting to know Carl and Ron, since they are almost the same age. In his bedroom, Ron introduces Carl to his friends Mikey and Nit and invites them to play video games. Carl just looks back incredulously. Ron apologizes and urges Carl not to rush to adapt to the new reality. He says it took Ennett, another newcomer from other people's walls, three weeks to open. Carl looks at Ennett curiously. During the interview, Carl says that his mother always wanted them to live in such a society. Later, at the house, he tells Rick that he likes the people in Alexandria, but they are weak, and I don't want us to become weak too. That evening, Rick tells Michonne that his security is still on the alert. Michonne objects that there is nothing to worry about. Then why aren't we both sleeping? He asks. Still not calmed down, Rick goes for a night walk and sees Jesse's husband, Pete, who is calmly smoking on the porch. Pete clicks Rick, noting that his wife cut his hair. Welcome to Alexandria, he says. At the interview, Carol poses as a caring housewife who has become the mother of Rick's group. She is asking for a job that will allow her to participate in society. Later, Carol leaves the house dressed in khaki and a sweater with a cardigan. She tells Daryl that her job is cooking food for people. It will allow her to get closer to her neighbors. She urges Daryl to clean himself up to look like everyone else, but he waves her off. In his interview, Glenn says that they need to establish relations with the new community. We've been there too long, he says. Meanwhile, Carl watches as Neat also makes his way through the wall. Intrigued, he follows her into the woods, but eventually loses her. Rick goes outside the gate to inspect the perimeter wall. He goes back to look for a gun that he hid near an abandoned house, but discovers that it is missing. Carl runs into Rick as a group of walkers approaches them. Together they deal with the dead. Glenn, Tara Other, meet with Nicholas and Aiden, Diana's son, to start their cargo delivery job. During a trial trip, Aiden explains to them that they must always follow his orders if they want to avoid being killed by walkers, like his previous team. Aiden and Nicholas lead the group to the place where they chained the walkers who killed their former team. They discover that the walker has escaped, but they manage to track him down. The walker attacks Tara, and Glenn impales him in the head. Aiden yells at Glenn for killing his trophy. When they return to the walls, Glenn accuses Aiden of incompetence. Aiden swings at Glenn and they fight, attracting a crowd of people, including Olivia, Jesse, and Stacy. Diana intervenes and announces that Rick and his group will be treated as equals. She then asks Rick and Michonne to become sheriffs of the city, and they agree. At the house, Rick comes downstairs in a sheriff's uniform and tells Carol and Daryl that it's safe to sleep in two houses now. Carol repeats Carl's fears that Alexandria will make them weak. We won't become weak, Rick assures her. It's not in us anymore, and we'll get through it. And if they fail? Let's take this place for ourselves. Sasha wakes up and looks at the family portrait left in the new house. She collects the portrait, as well as several other photographs, and takes them outside the walls of the house to shoot at targets. After destroying the targets, she sits down on a stump and quietly says to herself, come and get me. Rick, Daryl and Carol are in an abandoned house where Rick lost Aaron's gun, hiding it in a blender. They begin to make plans to return the weapons that were taken away from them when they came. A walker sneaks up on them, and Carol shoots him several times with a silenced pistol. The trio notices the letter W carved on the walker's forehead. Back at Rick's house, they ridiculously discuss the possible reasons why they were assigned security, wondering if this is part of a larger plan. While in the woods, Daryl runs into Aaron, who says he's surprised that Daryl can tell a sneaking walker from a human just by the sound they make. They meet a horse, which, according to Aaron, the children named Button. Aaron says he's been trying to catch him for months. Daryl makes an attempt, but the Button scares away groups of walkers. As a result, the walkers surround the horse and begin to attack. Aaron and Daryl kill the walkers, 
but Button Bright is seriously injured and has to be put down. While in her house, Diana tells Rick and Michonne about how they will guard the community. She also announces that Maggie will be helping her with political affairs. She further says that her plans are to restore the community government, as it was before the coup. On the street, Diana tells Rick that she doesn't want all the residents to walk around with guns. Sasha approaches them, says that he wants to be on duty at the bell tower with his sniper rifle and expresses a desire that there be as many shifts as possible at the armory tower. Diana grants the request, but only on the condition that her son Spencer will be on duty at the tower that evening so that Sasha can come to their party. Later, at Diana's party, the group struggles to adapt to the new environment. Diana invites Sasha to join her to chat with other guests. However, the noise triggers a series of traumatic memories of her brother Tyrese, her boyfriend Bobby and Beth. Sasha becomes shocked and angrily snaps at another guest, then runs out of the house. Jesse's son gives Rick a seal in the form of the letter A, officially welcoming him to the community. Later, Rick kisses Jesse on the cheek. Meanwhile, Daryl is standing outside the party, not wanting to go inside. Aaron invites Daryl to his house for dinner with him and Eric. After that, Aaron shows Daryl his garage, where old motorcycle parts are stored. He tells Daryl that he will need the motorcycle at his new job, where he has to replace Eric as a recruiter. Aaron explains that despite the dangers inherent in this job, it is perfect for a man like Daryl. After all, he knows how to take care of himself and distinguishes good people from bad. After unlocking the window earlier, Carol sneaks into the room where the weapons are stored. At the moment when she puts the weapon in the bag, Sam, Jesse's son, comes up from behind and asks what she is doing. Carol deflects the question by asking what he's doing there, and Sam replies that he wanted her to make more cookies. Carol advises him not to tell anyone that he saw her there. However, Sam insists that he should tell his mother because I tell her everything. Carol scares him with silence, offering two options. If he tells his mother, he will wake up one morning and find that he is outside the gate, tied to a tree so that walkers can find him. Alternatively, he can keep silent and get a cookie. The next morning, Dina approaches Sasha, who is looking at the gate. She tells Dina that Alexandria is not real. Dina respects her behavior, but says, this is nonsense. Dina puts a box of ammunition in Sasha's hand and lets her out of the gate. At their meeting place in the woods, Carol hands Rick and Daryl a gun, which Daryl refuses. Rick then goes for a walk in Alexandria, where he sees Jesse and her husband and briefly reaches for his gun. Then he hears a noise behind a steel wall between two houses and runs there. The walker is beating against it from the other side. Rick puts his hand on the wall and looks at the letter A stamped on his arm. Some time later, Gabriel's faith seems to be breaking down. He looks at a welcome note from one of the residents of Alexandria and starts tearing pages out of his Bible, but also meets with Reg, the architect who built the walls surrounding Alexandria. He expresses interest in being taught how to build, believing that it will be useful to have another person able to work on the walls as the community grows. Reggie agrees and gives him a diary in which he should start documenting Alexandria's growth. Electricity in the safe zone periodically disappears, so a small group goes to the nearest warehouse for spare parts. Eugene doesn't want to go, but they think he's too important to the process of finding what they need. After some persuasion, he reluctantly agrees to take a gun with him. Meanwhile, Jesse reveals to Rick that someone has destroyed the family owl statuette. He agrees to look into the matter. Arriving at the warehouse, Aiden thinks they should quickly go inside and get everything they need, but Glenn refuses, preferring to scout the perimeter first to know which exits are available if it's time to leave. After scouting, Nicholas and Aiden separate from the group to look for the necessary supplies, and the rest split into groups of two. Finding two dozen walkers locked behind a fence, Aiden tells everyone not to pay attention to them. He soon discovers one armored walker moving towards him and starts impulsively shooting at him in several places to try to slow him down rather than kill him directly. Despite Glenn's protests, he continues to shoot and accidentally hits a grenade in the hip of a walker. As a result of the explosion, Tara is seriously injured, and Eden is impaled on a broken shelf. Nicholas declares him dead and asks the others to leave his body to focus on breaking into the neighboring office and helping Tara. Sam visits Carol in search of cookies. Visibly annoyed, she coldly tells him that the only way to get the cookies is to steal a sample of chocolates. Inside the office, 
the group hears Aiden's cries for help. Although they are cornered by the walkers, they agree to try to save him, with Eugene remaining old and Glenn, but and Nicholas going jammed. Abraham now works for Tobin's construction team as they begin the process of expanding the wall. During the collection of materials at the construction site of the shopping center, they are attacked by numerous walkers. During the shootout, Francine is knocked off her perch. Tobin shows that he wants to leave her, but Abraham rushes to her and manages to save her life. Some time later, a drunk Pete wanders into the creek with several bottles of beer. Pete offers Rick a beer, but Rick refuses, saying he's always on the lookout. Pete tells Rick that he saw him drinking at a party. He tells Rick that due to the circumstances, they kind of have to become friends, and Rick agrees. The two exchange awkward phrases, after which Pete leaves the house, leaving Frick at a loss. After ranting in front of Tara's unconscious body about his cowardly nature, Eugene looks at the nearest exit. He leaves the office with Tara slung over his shoulder and manages to get them both outside to the van. Trying to help Aiden, Nicholas gives up and gives up trying. Before Noah and Glenn are forced to leave him walking, Aiden tells Glenn that the previous four people died because of him and that the cause of their deaths was that he violated the rules of his system. The rest of the group escapes through the opposite side of the warehouse. Eventually, all three find themselves trapped in a revolving door with walkers surrounding them on both sides. Tobin recommends that Dina appoint Abraham as the new head of construction, as he considers him a more suitable leader than himself. Elsewhere, Sam, having successfully stolen chocolates, delivers them to Carol. While baking cookies, trying to break the awkward silence, Sam confesses to Carol that he broke their owl figurine, saying that it happened because he was angry. He hints that he may need the gun for protection, but not for himself. When Carol tries to question him about what he said, Sam runs outside and returns to his house. Glenn is trapped in the revolving door section opposite Nicholas. Eugene stays on the van. Glenn suggests a plan to break the glass on their side to free himself from the other, and then free Nicholas. However, when Glenn tries to break the glass, Nicholas panics and selfishly forces the door open, squeezing into a safe place and opening Glenn's section to meet the walkers inside the building. Noah is dragged inside and devoured, while Glenn watches in horror. Nicholas returns to the van before Glenn and demands that Eugene take them home. Eugene demands to know what happened to Glenn and Noah. Nicholas forces him to get out and tries to leave, but Glenn intervenes and throws him to the ground, striking him several times in the face for leaving them with Noah, beating him down. Glenn tells Eugene to throw Nicholas into the back of the truck, after which they return to Alexandria. As they drive back, Eugene and Glenn grieve in silence. Eugene turns around to look at Nicholas Terra and sees the diary that Reggie gave to Noah. It is slightly ajar on the first page, on which only one sentence is written, this is the beginning. Gabrielle goes to Diana's house to tell her that Rick's group is dangerous and will destroy what she is trying to build. Unbeknownst to him, Maggie overhears this conversation from the basement stairs. Around the same time, Carol visits Rick to tell him that she thinks Pete is abusing Jesse and possibly doing the same to Sam. She tells Rick that in a situation like Pete's, there's no other choice, you'll have to kill him. Diana Reggie Spencer mourns the loss of Aiden while listening to his mix of metal music in the living room. Carol brings a casserole and a condolence note to the front door. Diana leaves the casserole on the step and burns the note. Sasha in the watchtower shoots at a walker knocking on the wall. Daryl and Aaron are behind the wall. Aaron mentions that there are more walkers here than usual. Daryl points to a faint light in the distance, indicating that this is why there are more walkers wandering in this direction. After that, Diana watches a video of her interview with Nicholas, where he talks about Aiden's death. Nicholas accuses Glenn of setting off an explosion in the warehouse, distracting Aiden, and adds that he himself was almost left to die by Glenn's group. In the video, Spencer can be heard asking what Diana is doing. She replies that she needs to record the video now, she will need it later. Diana forbids him and Glenn to leave the community. Nicholas says these people are not like us, I know you see it too. Dina disagrees, telling Nicholas that he doesn't know what she sees. Meanwhile, Glenn tells his true version of events to Rick, who is indignant that no one knows how to survive at all. Glenn insists they can be taught. Carol meets with Rick and renegotiates her offer to kill Pete. 
She says Sam once found Jesse on the floor bleeding after Pete knocked her unconscious. Carol adds that if Walkers hadn't killed her husband Ed, she wouldn't be standing here. I would, Rick objects. The face goes to the lake and looks at the water, clutching the stolen revolver and trying to restrain himself. Pete sees Rick and asks if he's okay. Lick warns him by continuing to walk, and Pete obeys. The next morning, Rosita tells Michonne that Sasha spent the night in the watchtower and did not return. As they search for Sasha in the forest, they realize that this is the first time they have been outside the walls since arriving in Alexandria. Michonne says she feels like she was asleep. The face approaches the cemetery and tells Diana about Pete. He is shocked to learn that Diana was protecting Pete because his medical skills are an advantage, despite his explosive nature posing a danger to others. Rick suggests separating Jesse and Pete, and if Pete doesn't cooperate, then kill him. We don't kill people, this is civilization, says Diana. Rick insists, but Dina stops him, I wouldn't kill you, she says. I would just send you away. Michonne and Rosita find dead walkers in the woods, all shot in the back of the head. She's hunting them, Michonne realizes. Carl secretly follows Zaynet into the forest. You're very loud, she finally says, beckoning him over. They playfully run through the trees and stop when they notice a walker. And Nit takes a timer out of his backpack and throws it at the walker. The buzzer is triggered, scaring away the walker. And Nit smiles and runs away again. Glenn gets Nicholas cleaning up Tara's blood from the back of the van. He scolds him for allowing four people, and recently Noah, to die during his trips for supplies. You're just a coward, Glenn says. People like you should be dead. He forbids Nicholas to leave the community alone or with anyone else. That's how you'll survive, he says. Are you threatening me? Nicholas asks. No, Glenn says, I'm saving you. Back in the woods, Carl asks, not the one about her past, but she replies that she doesn't think it's important. He doesn't agree, but before she can answer, they hear a herd of walkers approaching. They hide in a full tree trunk and wait for walkers to pass by. One of them has W written on his forehead. This is their world, we just live in it, she whispers. Carl fleetingly touches her hand when their eyes meet, finding themselves a few inches apart, but Carl backs away. Smiling, she notices that he is also afraid of her. Ignoring Glenn's instructions, Nicholas sneaks into the woods and digs something out of a hiding place a gun that Rick hid before entering Alexandria. Elsewhere, in the woods, Michonne and Rosita find Sasha killing a large gathering of walkers. Michonne and Rosita join Sasha and kill the walkers together. After that, Sasha shouts at them to leave her alone. Then she breaks down and admits her guilt for once telling Noah that he would not survive. In the woods, Daryl and Aaron notice a bonfire in the distance. They follow the trail and stumble upon a pile of chopped branches. It just happened, Daryl notices. Nearby, they find the naked and dismembered body of a woman tied to a tree with the letter W carved on her forehead. Did this just happen? Aaron asks, and Daryl grimly confirms it. She wakes up as a zombie, and Daryl gets rid of her by stabbing her in the head. Lick finds Jesse in her garage and tells her that he knows about Pete. I can take care of myself, she replies and goes into the house, closing the garage door at the same time. He enters Jesse's living room through the front door and demands that she let him protect her and her children from Pete, otherwise she will die. If you don't fight, you will die, he says. And I don't want you to die, and I can help you. Jesse asks if Rick would do the same for someone else, and he admits that he wouldn't. Jesse whispers yes when Pete enters the living room. Pete demands that Rick leave, but Rick refuses and orders Pete to leave with him. Pete explodes with anger and rushes at Rick. They start fighting, eventually flying out the window into the street, where Jesse follows them to try to break them up. Meanwhile, in the watchtower, Sasha watches the walkers approach the wall. She is distracted by sounds coming from inside Alexandria. Then she watches as all the residents start running to the center to find the source of the noise. All the residents, including Reggie and Spencer, gather around Rick and Pete, who beat and try to strangle each other. Sam hides behind Carol. Pete punches Jesse, once trying to intervene. Rick punches him and flips him over, pushing Carl away, who tries to stop him. Rick then strangles Pete. Diana orders them to stop. Or what? Rick shouts, brandishing a gun as Tobin, Nicholas and Glenn are about to intervene. Sasha snaps at the walkers. 
two have the letter W carved on their foreheads. In front of Jesse's house, a bloodied, hysterical Rick insists that the ignorance of the community about the real world leads to the death of people and that they should control who lives here and who does not. Diana coldly replies that it has never been so clear to her as it is now. Rick sarcastically asks if she is referring to him, and adds that her path will lead to the death of people. I'm not going to stand by and let this happen, he swears. If you don't fight, you will die, he adds. But before he can continue, Michonne unexpectedly strikes River on the head from behind, knocking him down. She takes his gun and looks at Diana. Morgan wakes up in the back seat of a car. He makes himself breakfast and sits down to eat it. Suddenly a man appears with the letter W on his forehead and points a gun at the morgue. They begin a conversation, during which the man tells a story about how the first settlers used the natives to hunt wolves. He also explains that he and his group spend their time moving from settlement to settlement, killing and robbing people along the way, while speaking in a friendly tone. Suddenly, the mood turns gloomy when the man declares his intention to take all of Morgan's possessions, including himself. Morgan replies that he doesn't mind the man taking his things, but refuses to let the man take him away. Suddenly, another man attacks Morgan from behind with a sickle, but Morgan easily evades the attack. He arms himself with his staff and easily defeats both. He offers them to leave, but is attacked again. Then he knocks both unconscious. He puts both men in the back seat of the car and honks several times. Then he takes the rabbit's foot and drives away. Daryl rides down the road on a motorcycle, and Aaron follows him in the car. They stop and get out of the car. Rick wakes up with his face covered in small bandages. Michonne is sitting next to the bed on a chair. Michonne says that Diana put Rick in the room to calm the situation. Glenn, Carol, and Abraham enter the room. Carol informs Rick that Diana is holding a meeting that night to decide what to do with Rick. She advises him to tell Dina that he took the gun to keep Jesse safe. Glenn informs Rick that people are now guarding the armory. Rick declares that if the meeting goes badly, he will whistle and they will take Reggie, Diana and Spencer hostage, threatening to cut their throats if they are not given access to the armory. Then he lies down to get some more sleep. Maggie talks to Dina about the upcoming meeting. She reminds Dinah that she has decided to let them all in, reminding her that she is putting Rick's fate in the hands of people who don't know all the sides of this story. She also points out that Rick has seen a lot and lost a lot during the time they spent outside the walls. Deanna objects that Rick pointed a gun at the residence. Maggie objects to her, claiming that he didn't pull the trigger. Reg intervenes and points out how Michonne stopped Rick, but Deanna simply states that she will do what she has to. Maggie leaves, but the speech follows her telling her that civilization begins when you stop running. You start living together and stop pushing people away, he says, and declares that he will raise this issue at the meeting that night. Meanwhile, Sasha is removing the bodies of the walkers she shot earlier. She throws the corpses into the pit, but suddenly stops. She lies down among the dead walkers and closes her eyes. Daryl notices that not so long ago someone passed by their place. They keep walking when Daryl asks Aaron if they sent people away. Three people, two men and a woman, Aaron answers. He says he thought it would work, but it didn't. He remembers that they drove them far away, took their weapons from them and gave them supplies for the day. He also says he can't repeat the same mistake. Rick will be Carol and hands him a gun and points out that Michonne knocked him out, but Rick assures that Michonne is still an ally. Daryl and Era are watching the man from afar. He smears dirt on his face which confuses Aaron. Daryl replies that he is doing this to scare away mosquitoes, and they begin to follow the man. Rick leaves the house and walks past Tobin and two other men. They greet each other, but Tobin looks at Rick with disbelief. When he passes by Diana's house, they exchange glances, but don't talk to each other. Glenn is sitting outside when Maggie appears and declares that she will try to resolve the situation. Meanwhile, Nicholas is watching Glenn with an evil expression on his face. Then he climbs over the wall, which is why Glenn is watching. Gabriel comes to the gate and says he wants to take a walk. Spencer points out that he has no weapons to defend himself, but Gabriel replies that he only needs the protection of God, and leaves Alexandria. Rick gets home and meets Carl, hugging him and apologizing for his behavior. They talk about the meeting and Rick says he wants Carl to stay at home. 
So this is home now? He asks. Rick confirms this, but says that in order to make the residents understand that they need Rick and his group, he may have to threaten or even kill one of them. Aaron and Daryl are watching several walkers on the other side of the fence they are standing at, they have lost track of the person they were following. Daryl says they need to find supplies, and knocks on the fence, luring walkers to him. They deal with the walkers and head inside the building. Climbing onto the loading platform, Aaron sees that one of the trucks has an Alaska license plate. Believing that the trailers are full of food, Daryl opens one of them. However, this turns out to be part of an elaborate trap, as as a result of a chain reaction, all trailers open, and walkers begin to come out of them, most of which are marked with the letter W, Daryl and Aaron crawl under the trailer and get out from the other side. They deal with several walkers using everything at their disposal, while Aaron is almost captured. They run to a nearby car and close the doors. A few walkers devour the car, but Aaron notices that the glass will last a couple of hours. Carol visits Pete at another house and asks him to check on Tara, but Pete refuses and asks her to leave. She pulls out a knife and declares that she can kill him right at this moment and make it look like Pete attacked her. She suggests Pete to attack her, but he does not attack, feeling indecisive. Then she says that he is weak and that if he plays his cards right, he may not die. Then she hands him the casserole and leaves. Pete drops the casserole and returns to the house. Glenn follows Nicholas behind the walls. He notices a trail of blood and finds a dead walker, after which he hears the crack of a branch. Suddenly Nicholas wounds him in the shoulder and he falls. Nicholas runs to the place where Glenn fell, but finds only a small trace of blood, since Glenn escaped. Rick approaches Jesse's house and finds her standing by a broken window. He tries to talk to her, but she says he should leave. He replies that he wanted to know if she was all right. Before leaving, he says he doesn't regret what he did. He starts to leave, but Jesse stops him. You were right, she says. When Rick leaves, Pete watches him from another house. Daryl and Aaron stay in the car. Daryl pulls out a knife and offers to take the walkers to give Aaron an opportunity to escape. Aaron, however, disagrees, answering that they will do it together. Just as they are about to leave the car, one of the walkers is suddenly killed by an unknown person outside, which gives Aaron and Daryl the opportunity to get out of the car. It turns out that the man who killed the walker is Morgan. All three engage in a short fight, after which they run to the gate, lock it and separate themselves from the walkers. They introduce themselves and thank Morgan for his help. Aaron starts talking about Alexandria and suggests Morgan go with them. No, thanks, Morgan replies, says he already has somewhere to go, but he's lost and needs landmarks, and hands Daryl a map. Opening the card, Daryl sees that it is the same card that Abraham left Rick at the church and smiles. Gabriel is walking through the woods when he comes across a walking, devouring man. He holds out his hand to him. I'm ready, he says, and the walker approaches him. At the last second, he begins to regret his decision and grabs the noose attached to the walker's neck and pulls on it until he beheads the walker. Then he takes a stone and finishes off the walker, smashing his head. He approaches the man who was devoured by the walker, and sees that he is still alive, but barely able to stand on his feet. Gabriel picks up a stone out of mercy and smashes a man's head. Then he breaks down, overcome with guilt and grief. Tara is lying in her bed, Eugene and Rosita are sitting next to her. Abraham enters the room, but when he sees Eugene, he turns around. Rosita stops him, saying that Eugene is asleep. Abraham sits down by Tara's bed, but Rosita intentionally drops some pots and will Eugene. Good afternoon, he greets dispassionately. He notes that Tara saved him, and also says that Abraham brought them here, after which he apologizes. After a few seconds of reflection, Abraham replies that he is sorry too. Eugene thinks an apology is unnecessary, but Abraham reminds him that he almost killed him. Gabriel returns to Alexandria. Spencer asks Gabriel to close the gate. Gabriel does this, but in his current state of mind only partially, leaving the gate slightly ajar. Nicholas walks through the woods and finds a walker. He shoots him, after which Glenn attacks him. Glenn gains the upper hand, knocking Nicholas to the ground and hitting him on the knee. Nicholas turns the arrows on Glenn, taking advantage of Glenn's bullet wound and pushes his thumb into him. A walker appears and Nicholas runs away, leaving Glenn on the ground with several walkers approaching. Michonne asks Rick if he's ready for the meeting. 
he admits that he stole a gun from the armory. Michonne says that they will find a way out of this situation, and asks Rick to stay out of trouble. He hands her the gun, but she returns it, wanting him to keep it for himself. She also says she will be with him no matter what, and leaves. Rick puts the gun in his belt and looks out the window. Noticing something outside, he hurries out. He finds the gate still open and notices a trail of blood. After closing the gate, he follows the trail. Sasha visits Gabriel in his chapel. She says she doesn't know what to do and asks if Gabriel can help her. He answers no. Diana and other Alexandrians gather together in the city center. Maggie wants them to wait until Glenn and Rick arrive, but Deanna insists they start anyway. She says they will talk about Rick, that he pointed a gun at them, and what he said the day before. Carol replies that they can sort it out. Meanwhile, Rick runs between the houses, looking for signs of walkers. Sasha says she wants to die, but Gabrielle just says she doesn't deserve to be in society. He claims that Bob's injuries and death were caused by her sins. She gets up and asks him to stop, but he continues, remembering Ares and saying that he deserved to die. This becomes the last straw for Sasha, who rushes at him. At the meeting, Michonne is given the floor. She talks about what it's like to live outside Alexandria, and says that Rick just wants his family to survive. Elsewhere, Rick finds several walkers and deals with each of them. Nicholas continues to wander through the forest, trying to get back to Alexandria. Glenn, who survived the encounter with the walkers, appears behind him and knocks him to the ground. Now the floor at the meeting is given to Carol. She explains that Rick saved her life, and says that they need people like him, and that although the events of last night were terrible, they should listen to him. In the chapel, Sasha and Gabriel continue to quarrel, and she hits him with the butt of a gun. Rick struggles with the last walker, pinning him to the ground. He manages to get a gun, and he starts thrusting it into the throat of a walker. In the woods, Glenn brutally beats Nicholas. Abraham explains to the participants of the meeting that there is a huge ocean of shit and that Rick knows everything about it. Rick kills the walker by firing his gun, causing his face to explode and he is splattered with blood. Two men whom Morgan met earlier stop at the same object that Daryl and Aaron stumbled upon, with them a man in a red poncho, whom Daryl and Aaron were following. One of the men asks him not to move before cutting his throat. Welcome home, he replies coldly. Maggie tells the group that Herschel respected Rick, and says that Rick is also a father who cares about what he does. She says the band is a family and she won't let it break up. Diana tells the group about Gabriel's visit and says that Rick proved what Gabriel told me about the group by fighting Pete. Maggie leaves. Glenna blames Nicholas for Noah's death, then puts a gun to his forehead. Sasha, knocking Gabriel to the ground, grabs a rifle and aims at him with a crazy expression on his face. Tobin speaks at the meeting, stating that he only wants his family to be safe. He falls silent when a bloodied Rick enters the meeting, carrying the corpse of a walker. He throws it on the ground in front of the whole community. Nicholas begs for his life, finally realizing his mistakes, but not wanting to pay for them with his life. Glenn tries to silence him to make things easier for himself, but eventually gives up and decides not to shoot. Sasha is left with a gun pointed at Gabriel when Maggie enters and convinces Sasha to drop the weapon. Gabriel says she should have let her kill him, and, breaking down, replies that they died because of me. Rick informs everyone that there were no guards at the gate and that the walkers ventured in themselves. He says that the dead and the living will always try to find their way in. While Rick gives his speech, Judith and Carl listen to the music box, Glenn helps Nicholas return to Alexandria. One of the wolves is looking through photos of the pack that Aaron dropped during their escape, Tara wakes up in her bed, and Sasha, Maggie and Gabriel are praying in the chapel. Rick assures them that they will survive and that he will show them. He also notes that he does not regret what he did, but regrets that he did not tell them about it earlier. Suddenly, a drunken Pete bursts into the meeting, brandishing Michonne's katana. You're not one of us. He shouts. Reg tries to stop him, but Pete refuses to listen. Then Reg tries to stop Peter physically, but he pushes him away, accidentally cutting his throat with a katana. The Alexandrians scream in shock and horror as Rez falls, bleeding from his throat and mouth, and a confused Diana tries to help him. Reg soon bleeds out and dies in Dina's arms. Diana cries from the bottom of her heart, 
but her mournful expression soon turns to rage. Rick looks at Dina and she says, do it. Without hesitation, he turns around and kills Pete with a shot to the head. Another voice is calling from somewhere far away. Rick looks up and sees Morgan standing in front of him, as well as Daryl and Aaron. They both exchange stunned looks. Later, Michonne prepares to attach her katana back to the wall. Soon she changes her mind, sheathing her katana and equipping it. Later, a man in a red poncho passes by a car with the inscription wolves nearby. 